All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second uh, public comment session on the Town of Enfield and Enfield Public Schools uh, School Security Initiative. Um, just to give you the, um, the process for this evening, um, right at the beginning, once I'm done giving you the, the process, we're going to have uh, the folks that are up here at the front table introduce themselves and um, let you know what they represent. Um, followed by the quick introductions, we're going to have a presentation by Matt Coppler, our town manager. And once Matt is done uh, with his presentation, we'll open it up to, uh, to the question and answer. We want this to be an interactive session, back and forth. Did, is Suzanne here? Is there a sign up? So, okay, far back table. So to my left, your right, the far back circle table, there's a sign that says, please sign up here. If you could uh, put both your name and your address and I believe we're asking for email address as well. And um, if you could complete that. We'll use that to call on people, but at some point in time we know that the list will, will end, um, but we'll have an opportunity if folks did not sign up and, and want to speak or people want to speak for a second time um, until uh, everyone has had their opportunity to speak and, uh, and have had their questions answered. Um, so with that, uh, Matt's got a microphone, so he's going to introduce himself, and then we'll pass it down. And just so you know, I'm Scott Copen, the mayor. Go ahead, Matt. Matt Coppler, town manager. Chris Bromson, uh, director of public safety, and also I'd like to recognize, in case there are any questions later, four of our SSOs, Mike, Ed, Sean, and Barry Robert Berger, who's at the end of the aisle there. Uh, I'm Greg Stokes on the uh, Town Council, also the Chairman of the School Security uh, Committee. Hello everyone, I'm Carl Sfrazza, I'm the Police Chief here in town. Donna Suzak, I'm Town Council at Large. Cindy Mangini, Town Council at Large and member of the School Security Committee. Good evening, Ray Peabody, Board of Education. Tom Sherrard, Chairman of the uh, Enfield Board of Education and also co-chair of the Security Committee. Benny Grady, also a member of the Board of Education and a member of the School Security Committee. Tom Arnone, Council at Large. Ed Denny, District 4, Counselor at Large. Just Counselor. <laughs> okay, so with that, um, we're going to have Matt come up. Um, do his presentation, and then we'll get into the uh, to the question and answer session. Matt. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this uh, nice, balmy uh, spring night. I'm supposed to laugh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's about the uh, highlight of any jokes I can tell. So I'd like to start, though, uh, with why we're here. In uh, 2013, the Board of Education and the Enfield Town Council signed a memorandum of understanding creating the school security partnership. Part of that memorandum, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, uh, started, or uh, the memorandum ends the security program after two years. And that's why we're here tonight, is we're coming up very quickly to the end of the uh, agreement between the Board of Education and the Town Council. And as part of that ending, uh, they're now starting a review process to see if they want to continue this going forward or to end the program at the end of the uh, memorandum. And there was a meeting uh, about a month and a half ago between the Board of Education and the Town Council that said that they want to get as much public input on this program as they can. And so they laid out a series of four public meetings, which this is actually the second one, although it's the scheduled third one because we had uh, a little bit of snow I heard one night. And uh, this is the opportunity for the public to voice for or against continuation of this program. To give you a little bit of historic background with this, uh, going way back to January of 2013, uh, the board and the council created a school security committee. That led to uh, a long review process 
of the security measures that were being uh, thought about within the school system um, and made a number of proposals actually to both the board and the council that ultimately led to the MOU being drafted. And then in March of 2013, the council and the board approved that. And a little bit later in that year, we actually signed uh, memorandums as well with the non-public schools, the three non-public schools. So at this point in time, we have school security officers in, in every public and non-public school within the town of Enfield. Late in uh, 2014, September 2014, it was when the review process really started. Uh, the town brought in a uh, expert in school security to do a number of assessments, not only of the overall program, but each of the different buildings and to see and make recommendations, which we'll talk about here in a little bit as well. And then as I said, uh, in December is when the board and the council got together and said, okay, let's have a good review process. And hopefully to put this kind of at the end of the process, um, sometime in April or May, they will have to make a decision whether this program continues or not. You heard uh, some of the board members and council members introduce themselves, say that they were a part of the school security committee. Uh, this is the school security committee, and you see obviously council members, board members, but also a variety of uh, town board employees, as well as uh, the fire district's representative on this. And just one more comment on this, is there is a whole series of people behind all of these people as well doing a lot of work. And uh, I think uh, we also had building department, public works, number of people from public works, IT. It's just it's a whole town and board effort to uh, bring security to the forefront for the public school system. So this here is, is some of the key points that uh, come out of the memorandum of understanding. Uh, primarily, it allowed for the placement of school security officers in all school facilities. It also assigned the responsibility for oversight, the funding, the duties, responsibilities, and also the required certifications for all the school security officers. It also provided for the process for enhancement of the school security within the facilities because, you know, what the town cannot do, the Board of Education must do. And the Board of Education is responsible for all the procedures and policies that take place within the schools. And so there had to be a partnership looking at, you know, what not only enhancements need to be made physically to the buildings, but also the enhancements to the schools, the school policies that kind of lay over top of all the things that we've put in place from the facility or the personnel side. And it also provided for a process review and revision of the safety protocols and emergency procedures in the schools. We like to think of our uh, school security program uh, from the concept you see in front of you. They're pillars that keep the schools safe. They keep the roof on for the school security. And uh, the four pillars are the prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And again, maybe to define a little bit so you have an understanding of what each of these uh, pillars are, uh, prevention and mitigation, we break down into two different uh, types. We have the bricks and mortar, the hard hardening that we do within the uh, buildings, you know, making sure the access points are secure. Uh, interior doorways and classrooms, making sure they lock and have proper locks. Technology enhancements, cameras, communication technology, notification, um, remote view technology cameras. Um, but also, there was an understanding that to truly provide a preventative measure was also looking at the, the mental health issues within the system as well. And uh, even before all this started, the uh, schools and the town uh, had a really good partnership on suicide prevention. But one of the things that we saw as part of this was even providing more strength to that, more of a partnership to look at the needs of the, uh, the children within the school system to make sure that, that you know, we are providing the, the necessary uh, mental health uh, resources to the schools. Preparedness activities, uh, 
We implemented uh, limited access into the school buildings with the new inter or with the intercom systems, uh, guest identification sign-in procedures, and we've spent uh, quite a bit of money here in the last year uh, coming up with a, a more computer-oriented one. Um, and then reviewing and updating the procedures and protocols for how people come into buildings, you know, how they circulate around, and uh, also what, what they do once they're in here. Uh, response, I think, is the more visible thing that has been done and what has gotten a lot of people talking, which is our school security officers. Um, but also the work with the uh, police department who had actually started probably back in 2007, 2006, uh, quite a bit of the uh, active shooter protocols that because of the integration of the school security officers within the police department, we are, are working together. And so if there is an incident, everybody is you know, reading off the same page in the playbook for how to react to these type of events. And of course, recovery. Um, you know, when you see the, the, the bad things that do happen, what you never really hear or see or t people talk about is the aftermath, the immediate aftermath. And there's been a lot of work uh, by the town staff and the school staff to come up with, you know, how do you, uh, you know, bring together the parents and the children after an event. And uh, we look at this actually not only from the school perspective, but from the town perspective in buildings, as well as, uh, you know, any type of crisis that may happen at a, a business or anywhere else within the town. But for tonight, we're just talking about the schools. Um, we're also working on a crisis intervention team, as well as communication plan to uh, make sure people are aware of what's going on after something happens. So the school security officers. Currently, we have uh, 21 officers working in 15 school facilities. So that's the public plus the non uh, public schools that we have. All SSOs are former law enforcement personnel, and uh, I, I liked this, this part of this slide because from the review that we, see, uh, we received from uh, Safe Havens International, they said, in fact, these officers are more experienced, have more training, are better educated than the average sworn law enforcement officer in Connecticut. And, you know, I want to give kudos to the chief to uh, Director Bromson, as well as the Deputy Superintendent Chris Strezik sitting back there. Hello. Um, you know, they were responsible for recruitment and hiring and selection of each of the school security officers. And again, if you've had interaction with any of our school security officers, you'll know that they did a heck of a job. Um, we are very proud of each and every member that they hired to bring on staff. Each SSO must pass firearm certification each year just like all of our police officers. Uh, every SSO must take state-mandated 24-hour certification training. SSOs go through live fire scenario-based simulations, and we'll be doing it again, I think, later this year, another round of that. And of course, as I said earlier, they're integrated into the Enfield Police Department active shooter programs and protocols. So going back, excuse me, Going back to the, uh, the memorandum of understanding, it lays out there what activities and duties the SSOs can do. And I think it's very important because there, there is, at times, some uh, confusion about what they can and cannot do. Uh, they cannot conduct any search or seizure of the person or property of any student, student or any, any other individual at any time. The town and BOE acknowledges and agree that BOE is solely responsible for taking any disciplinary action with respect to students, and the SSO shall have no role with respect to such disciplinary action. And they shall not have any access to any student record information. The board had to authorize, because the state law does not allow people to carry weapons within the schools except for sworn police officers. And so even though they are trained, they have been uh, sworn police officers, uh, under the, the letter of the law, they're not sworn police officers. So the Board of Education had to pass a resolution, I assume is what, what it would have been, that lets them carry weapons. And actually, an off-duty police officer technically at one point couldn't carry a weapon into the schools, but again, they allowed that to happen. So 
you know, it's, it's very exact what the state law allows and doesn't allow, but the board has been very good in working with the, the town to allow that. They can't store or leave any firearms unattended on the premises of the schools. And, you know, the last one, one of the reasons they're there, you know, they can and will, if necessary, use deadly force. One of the things that, that has come up throughout the last two years is, you know, people confuse an SSO with an SRO. And so I wanted to, to provide a little bit of background on that so tonight uh, when you come, if you come up to speak, you can understand the difference because SROs, school resource officers, are fully certified sworn police officers. And I believe uh, we first started putting SROs in the schools in the 90s, in the early 90s. And so there's been this misconception, I think, again, that we've heard uh, throughout the last two years that there's never been guns with police officers in the schools. The fact is, it goes back into the 90s. And so this, this table kind of goes back and forth and shows hopefully a little bit of a difference between the school resource officer and a school security officer. There's a lot of similarities. And again, each one of those men and women that are a part of that program they could easily be on that other side, but they retired. And they made a decision to come work for, for our schools and for our children. Again, I, I just kind of want to go over some of the different duties and responsibilities that uh, a school security officer, and this is by no means a, a comprehensive, and actually earlier this evening was uh, talking to one of our SSOs, and uh, you know, it's amazing what these, these men and women do for us. Um, and hopefully some of you already know some of these things. But uh, security functions, just reading a couple, uh, daily routine security checks, you know, they find doors that are unsecure, so they, you know, have to go remind people not to prop the doors open. Um, you know, they do uh, routine panic alarm checks. Uh, I think uh, earlier, again, talking with one, you know, he's making sure that uh, each child that comes out of a car gets safely out of the car. Uh, and you might think, well, why would you do that? Well, nearly had a child drug, drug away by a car because the uh, strap to his backpack got caught in it. And he was able to stop that before something bad did happen with that. Unruly students, uh, and that goes to the uh, student interaction. Again, you know, we've had situations in the schools where uh, children, unfortunately, have tried to leave school. Uh, and uh, fortunately, SSOs are there to help bring them back into the schools so they don't injure themselves. Uh, a lot of, a number of medical assistance uh, calls, uh, you know, understand that that again, being sworn police officers, they had been given a lot of uh, first aid training, um, and even probably more importantly today, they have a radio on their side. And so when something happens, they are already calling the dispatch and getting in motion a police officer, and if necessary, one of our ambulances. And again, have a lot of different uh, other duties here we could talk about. Um, again, talking about overseeing the drop-off, protection of staff from unruly students, uh, monitor school campuses and redirects not educational personnel during school day. Um, but you know, even more importantly, and, and something that we talked about a lot as part of this, is you know, how they would become a part of the school culture. And being a part of the school culture means that they also be role models. And I think, again, the stories, anecdotal stories that I'm being told are that they have achieved that. And you know, they're people that are looked up to, respected, when there's issues, kids go to them. And that's, again, part of being that school culture that we felt that they would be. Of course, none of this comes free. Um, it does cost us some money. And so we put together this really uh, quick, down and dirty uh, cost of school security program. I know that uh, people like to throw out numbers. And I think uh, people have said, when we first started this, this cost was anywhere from a million and a half to $5 million. And, and uh, more recently, I'm hearing people adding up those lines and saying, well, this program's caught us you know, almost $2 million. But again, perspective is that operationally, this program is costing us 
um, in the current budget year, $794,000. We've put quite a bit of money on the capital side, again, in that hardening and security cameras and panic buttons and communication systems, incredible upgrades we've done there. Um, and I want to point out there all the way to the right that all this funding comes out of the town side budget, it does not come out of the school budget. We've also been very fortunate. Uh, the state has stepped forward, and I think it was two years ago, or about a year and a half ago, started a reimbursement program and put $15 million out there for schools all across the state of Connecticut to get reimbursed for security improvements. The town has been very fortunate to uh, be awarded two such grants, uh, Grant A, Grant B. Grant A is from last year, Grant B is this year. Um, so well over 600000 nearly $600,000 is coming back to the town in reimbursement for the programs, uh, excuse me, for the hardening and technology improvements that we've made to the school system. And I talked about uh, having an expert come in in September. Uh, hopefully some of you may have participated in the uh, public hearing we had with this. Uh, Safe Havens International was the uh, company we selected. Uh, one of the more well-known, worked with uh, private, nonprofit uh, type agencies that works all over the world and works with a lot of the uh, federal and state services within the United States. And by the way, um, we do have over there some copies of this uh, report if you want to see it. And this also is on our website. If you go to the police uh, web part of our website webpage, you'll find this right there on, on their page. Again, uh, just going over some of the quicker ones here. Uh, very impressed with our uh, school security officers that were brought on. Um, felt that the uh, program safety in relation to the cost was very good, cost effective. Um, the uh, school building administrators overwhelmingly wanted to continue to have uh, the SSOs in their buildings. And uh, they felt that we've developed an excellent approach to the suicide prevention. And, and again, that's one of the things people really don't talk about, how that really works in layers as part of our school security program. Because again, when you look at a number of these school shootings and school incidents, it's the kids themselves that are doing this. And generally, there's a mental health issue that hadn't been addressed or been ignored. And so that's something I think that both the Board of Education and Town Council take very seriously and are trying to uh, correct within our system. Again, they gave uh, a lot of uh, kudos to our uh, police department and fire and emergency management for the uh, reunification plan and the improvements that were made there. Um, just, you know, again, they found a lot of good things that we are doing um, that, frankly, are not being done in most places in the United States today. But they are starting to catch up to us. But they also had a series of recommendations. And uh, a lot of these recommendations we have been looking to uh, implement now um, and start moving forward. You know, the communications between the town council, board of education, employees of the schools, and the community. And again, I think that's one of the reasons why the board and the council wanted to have these input sessions was to try to address, you know, one of the shortcomings that uh, Safe Havens pointed out to us. They felt that, uh, to get even more benefit from our SSOs, we need to look at to increase the scope of work. And one of the, the bigger issues there, again, is being that role model, integrating more into the schools um, within the classrooms themselves. They felt that uh, more training related to the school safety, security, emergency preparedness measures and drills were necessary within the schools. And again, to the credit of the uh, Board of Education, they brought a gentleman on to start overseeing that and now there are a lot of drills going on within the schools that, again, help prepare for any possible eventuality. Real quick, there uh, is the uh, web page. You can find that right at that website. 
And that's a quick overview of the program so we can get to your input. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks for uh, the presentation. We do have, um, again, if, if you'd like to speak, um, there's a sign-up list. It's in the, in the back uh, left-hand corner of the CAF. Um, please uh, add your name, address, and signature. And uh, we'll go through the list, and then if um, we exhaust through the list and, and folks just want to speak from the audience, We'll, we'll call on people from the audience. So, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, let you know who the first person up and then also the person that's on deck. And so if that person that's on deck could start making their way up um, after uh, the person has spoken and the questions have been answered. So we first have James Smith followed by Michael Helichu. And there is no time limit. If you have a specific question that you want um, addressed to a specific person, just say, um, I'd like this question answered by the chief, et cetera. Um, and it is meant to be interactive, Q&A back and forth. And so if you're not happy with the answer, just stay and say, um, I'd like a clarification. So welcome, James. Good evening. Um, I'm here to support the uh, security that we have at schools. Uh, I've been a resident here for uh, about 11 years in Enfield, um, originally from Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I uh, went to schools that had security, that uh, we had riots in our school. And uh, after the tragedy in uh, Newtown, I remember dropping my daughter off and just looking at her walking to school and uh, wondering if something's going to happen that day. Ever since the security started in Enfield, I felt so secure inside and um, I know it was uh, it's going to be an issue with money but uh, I think whatever it would take to keep our kids safe it, no matter what the money is it should be done and I feel so happy that they have security there for my kids and I just hope to continue to keep it and I hope they don't get rid of it thank you for your thank you James next up Michael Helichu followed by Don Hunt Hi, Mike, Mike Halichu, 31 L Meadows. Uh, I've been in Enfield about 34 years. And first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I know you come out on a lot of nights, and I appreciate the fact that you're here to hear what the public has to say. Now, I know all of you know the definition of pragmatic, but I'd like to start off with the definition just for the record because it's the centerpiece of my comments tonight. Pragmatic means dealing with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on a practical rather than a theoretical consideration. As a taxpayer and voter in Enfield, it's realistic to expect that the governing body is going to be pragmatic when it comes to spending my tax dollars. There are many things that we should have. Services for families living below the poverty level, infrastructure repairs and maintenance, more police officers for Thompsonville, extra money for snow removal, upgrades to our water treatment facility. Are taxpayers willing to pay more tax dollars to get them? Uh, I'm afraid you won't see the parents, teachers, and school children who have been speaking out in favor of this program speaking in favor of a tax increase for more snow removal equipment. And in fact, you may see some of them coming back to protest cuts that you want to make to Dr. Schumann's recent budget request. Are armed school guards essential? Well, no one can predict what 
other Adam Lanzas are going to do, to do. But are you ready to add thousands of dollars to our budget in response to every tragedy? If a gunman attacks a senior center in Windsor Locks, would you add $30,000 for armed guards for our senior center? If a knife-wielding escaped convict kills seven people on a bus in Willington, will you add $100,000 worth of armed guards to the magic carpet and dial-a-ride buses? Now, as a senior citizen, I'd be really interested in knowing and hearing your uh, reasons for not funding that, but I'm going to let you off the hook because, of course, we're talking about theoretical situations here. Suffice it to say that cost and an already tight budget would be major pragmatic considerations for your deliberations. I get the impression that the majority of people speaking at the other forum that you had and, and Mr. James tonight are, are clearly happy with the armed guards <clears throat> and they're happy that their children are safe in schools. If you vote to continue the program, you'd be justified in saying that the majority of people who spoke out spoke in favor of the program. But I'm afraid that there are a lot of people sitting at home assuming that you've already made your minds up about keeping the program, and I hope that's not the case. Spending nearly a million dollars a year for armed school guards is not pragmatic. It's a decision I believe, based on a gut-wrenching reaction to a terrible tragedy. I'm against spending that much money on a program at this time. Could we consider it somewhere down the road? Sure, when my paycheck catches up to the cost of living. Pulling the guards isn't going to put our children in any more danger than they were before or since September or December 2012. But it would prove to me that you're truly concerned about how and where every single tax dollar is spent, not to mention one million of them. Your decision will tell me whether or not you think a million dollars is a significant amount of money or chump change. I urge you to make a practical, pragmatic decision and curtail the program for now. The taxpayers of Enfield deserve at least that much. Thank you for inviting the public to speak and for taking the time to listen to our opinions. Thank you, Mike. Next up is Don Hunt, followed by Ann Sarpu. Hi, um, my name is Don Hunt, and I do have kids that go to school in Enfield, and I do support the security guard program. Um, I've heard people say, I've actually heard more people against it than in support of it, so I'm surprised by the previous man's comments, but um, I feel like it's an added layer of security, that it's necessary to, to protect our kids. Um, I've heard the chief speak about, you know, his personal conversations with the chief at Sandy Hook, and in my opinion, you can't put a price on the lives of our kids. I realize you can't predict every possible tragedy that could occur in town. Crazy people are going to do crazy things, but school shootings are not theoretical, and they can happen, and sadly they can happen in the elementary schools. Um, I think we need to do whatever we can to protect our kids, and this is just one added layer. Um, and I mean, I have personal experiences with the guards here at Crandall, and I think they're great. They do a lot besides just watch that door, and a lot of people don't realize that. And there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that these guys are, are helping our kids with. And I think it's important that our kids learn that the police and these guards, that there are, these are trusted authority figures. These aren't people they should fear. Um, it shouldn't be scary to come to school, and they shouldn't fear a trusted authority figure with a gun. Um, and these guys do a great job. And these kids high-five them, and they're great. They're friendly. Um, they do a good job. And they help the parents, too, a lot. And um, I, ultimately, I trust the people that are experts in safety to make the decisions that are going to keep our kids safe. I feel like this is an effective program. I'm happy to pay my tax dollars towards it. Um, 
yeah, there's a lot of other things I think this town could use, but to me this is important. I do have kids. I have kids of all ages in this town, and, and I do expect the, job, the, the town to do what they can to protect my kids. So I do support the program, and I hope it continues. I think it's important. So thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, Ann Sar Sarpu is next, followed by Ann, and last name begins with a P. I can't write, read, so you're on deck. Hi, Ann. Good evening. I do not personally have children that the security officers are keeping safe in our schools. I am the principal at St. Martha School. If a parent were to come up to me and ask me about security at St. Martha School, I would inform them of the many components of our school's safety. And as I listened this evening about the four pillars, I jotted down in my margin how our school safety follows the four pillars. We have preparedness. I would tell a parent that we have security cameras placed around the building that the administrative assistant assists with viewing the images on her computer. We are prepared. All the exterior doors are locked and the glass has been fortified. All the classroom doors are locked at all time. Visitors need to be buzzed in and they present their photo ID to the school security officer. The visitor leaves their ID at the main office and obtains a pass, visitor pass. The school security officer patrols the school campus to ensure that the student's safety is paramount. I hope that we don't ha have to have recovery, hence the fact that we have the school security officer in our building. I believe that if the school security officers were to be removed, then one facet of our security plan, as well as I believe at the other schools in Enfield, would be eliminated. I received a letter in September, and as I was jotting my notes this evening, his letter came to my recollection. It reads, I won't use his name as I didn't ask, I didn't get a chance to call him. Good morning, my name is, I am the father of Anne, who is newly enrolled in your kindergarten program. I am writing this letter to compliment your security guard on his actions yesterday morning when I dropped Anne off. As I dropped Anne off yesterday, I watched a young girl run out of the school attempting to chase her mother down as she was leaving. She ran straight toward the driveway and just as she went to run into the road in front of a moving car, your security guard grabbed her before her feet hit the asphalt. I was amazed. It took me by surprise, but your guard, and forgive me for not knowing his name yet, chased her from the doorway and caught her just in time. He should be commended for his actions. He acted quickly and really prevented something that may have been an unfortunate act from taking place. I know currently they are discussing the need for these positions in our school. I understand that we believe that they are there for the worst case scenarios. I can tell you that I do appreciate him from being there every morning. It brings a sense of safety. And after seeing him help the girl, I feel he definitely belongs there. He not only provides a feeling of safety, but he provides the actions of safety as well. Thank you, sincerely, the father. In addition to the security officer doing that, we also feel that the security officer has a direct communication with the Enfield Police Department and Emergency Services. There have been a few occasions when St. Martha's School has needed an ambulance and the officer has placed the request before one would have been placed by the school office, thus saving critical time. This leads me to believe that if an intruder were to gain access into St. Martha, the officer would be in touch with the Enfield Police Department instantaneously, and the school security officer would engage the intruder before the Enfield Police Department arrived two to three minutes later. Students also feel, in one of the slides, spoke about the environment. Students feel that our security officer is part of our environment. I recall back, um, back a year ago, I was involved in a training exercise that the Enfield Police Department had us um, administrators participate in. At that time, I realized how imperative it is for a person to be dedicated to the safety of the children. It can't be on the shoulders of the administration or the staff. I think back when my children were young, and I think about the many things that I did to the, for them and with them, and I didn't think about the cost for them or that the activity required. 
I would hope that the program would not be eliminated because we were only considering a monetary value. I hope that my examples exemplify the fact that there is, that there is the need for the security officers to continue at our schools because they are more than just protecting our children. With these security officers at the school, children are able to focus on why they are at school every single day, and that is to learn, instead of thinking about, what their, sa about their safety. And yes, I would be willing to pay more for snow removal if it were to s save someone from slipping and hurting themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Ann, if you can give us your last name. Ann Percival. Percival, okay. Um, Ann, you're up next, followed by Ron Army. Thank you. I appreciate the broad scope of the four pillars of security described by our town manager, Mr. Coppler, yet I do not want the program placing armed school security officers in the schools to be reinstated. I feel that an armed school security officer is unlikely to deter either a mentally ill or purposely hateful perpetrator from carrying out a violent attack on school property. I would rather see these monies redirected toward programs that address mental health and school-wide inclusion initiatives that reduce the sense of isolation in some young people that may lead to violent reprisals. Thank you for the opportunity to present my viewpoint. I wish that this question had originally been put to a townwide vote prior to committing such a large investment from our town council's budget. Respectfully submitted, Ann Percival. Thank you, Ann. Ron, you're up next, followed by Claudia Good. I didn't fill this whole book, so don't, don't panic. Uh, I, I do want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I'd like to preface that what I'm going to say with this, I'm opposed to the gods. And also, most. My name is Ron Army. I live on 30 Field Road. And uh, I'm still opposed to the gods. And uh, primarily, I am concerned about the money. And secondly, I don't think you're getting the most bang for your buck. My feeling is that there is enough technology out there that once you invest in it, it will be ongoing and you just add to it. And I think you can buy a lot of technology for, well, for a million six hundred thousand dollars. That's what we've spent so far, a million six. And I think you can buy a lot of cameras. I think you can buy, like the lady mentioned that bingo he had the walkie-talkie. Well, bingo. Do you know how many walkie-talkies I can buy you for a million six? Do you know, have any idea how many iPads you can buy for $800,000? I think you can buy 1,331. Or maybe 33. Or maybe you can get a deal. And I am very concerned that the money maybe coming from the schools. And I guess I have a question first for uh, the town manager. Where does the $800,000 come from? It comes from the town, correct? Okay, so am I to believe that you take $800,000 and you set it aside before you start your budget? At some point in time, that 800 grand has got to show up, right? Okay. And the school board has nothing to do with the $800,000, correct? Okay. So let's pretend that the council meets in caucus, the Democrats some nights and the Republicans other nights. And let's pretend that somebody says, you know, Let's don't have a tax increase this year. 
And let's pretend that a lot of people say, son of a gun, that's a good idea. Let's don't have a tax increase this year. So the 800000 is committed. That's one-third of a mil, correct? A mil is 2.2? Okay, well, a little bit higher than 2.2 could be 2.4. We're still at a third. So already this two years, you've spent two-thirds of a mil. And last year, there was a vote and it almost didn't get that the town was going to pay for the technology. The vote almost went the wrong way. But the town paid for the technology. What if the board, what if the council had not voted for the technology, that they were going to pay the technology? You can't knock off the 800,000 because you've already committed to that and you've continually committed to that. So guess where that money is going to come from from that technology? Yeah, that money's coming from the Board of Education. Any way you slice it, if you're planning no tax increase, that's the only place it's coming from. And that is a big concern I have. I've had three kids go through this whole school system. In fact, all three of them went right here to Prudence Crandall. I currently have a grandson and a granddaughter in school. And they're relatively safe. But now I have some other questions. We talked about where, where else did you look at where, what other schools have what that you looked at and you thought armed guards were better than? Um, Mr. Army, I, I can tell you that um, about two months after the Newtown tragedy, the town of Enfield was contacted by the Board of Ed and the town council of the city of Newtown. They came to Enfield. They really didn't want publicity at the time. We met with them, and they told us that um, they wanted to implement what we're doing here. They just don't know how we did it. So we explained it to them, and they went on to put it in place. So in, this, in the town of Newtown right now, you asked Mike, the chief over there, they have what they refer to as the Enfield plan. He also informed me, and this was last, what, two weeks ago I talked to him, that the communities surrounding Newtown are in various stages of implementation of the Enfield plan. In addition to that, I can tell you that the uh, city of Glastonbury, Connecticut, Branford, um, are doing it the way we're doing it with security officers. But what I think people don't realize is that the schools that don't have school security officers, a lot of them have SROs, which are the police officers. So people would say that there's only three or four schools in the state doing it. And I would submit to you that if you count the police officers in the schools, I know that in Springfield they have 20 guys in schools just doing security for the schools. I can't give you the figure, but I'm going to just go out on a limb and say at least half or more have some type of armed law enforcement professional in their building. It may be a cop. It may be a retired cop. So I can't give you the exact number of how many. Well, you know, I, I, I have not heard that Newtown had armed forces in their schools. Sure. And I, I can understand that. You know why? Because the newspaper, um, not, not picking on any of the newspapers here, of course, but I read it somewhere. And they missed, what happened was they had a budget vote. And I'm not sure the budget process down there, they voted down the budget. The chief told me this had nothing to do with the guards. What it had to do was with the budget program, and they are up and running right now exactly the way we're doing it because they feel the level of safety that we're doing is what they want. And by doing it with SSOs versus the sworn officer, they're doing it at a third of the cost. It's approximately 90 with benefits, it's about ninety to ninety-five thousand dollars to to hire a police officer for the year. We only use the guards 180 days plus some training. It's about thirty-six thousand. It's being done for a third of what it would cost. But Newtown is absolutely doing it. Well, well, sir, I don't think you need armed guards in elementary schools. Just just to follow up to to your to your point about who else is doing it and where. Um, Connecticut is uh, a little behind the rest of the nation. 
the experts and the seminars and the places we've gone, it's up to calculation. About two-thirds of the school districts in the country have some form of armed security, whether it's SROs, police, or other safety uh, armed personnel. I can tell you two other examples of Connecticut I know of. One was, I believe, in the current last year. It was a security consulting firm out of New York. Rocky Hill hired them. Their recommendation came back, put in armed school security like like we have done. I talked to, when we went to a seminar, Captain Hall and I, New England State Police Association, the expert that was there was uh, retained by Quinnipiac College in Hamden. Uh, they have a school security uh, officers program. Uh, his recommendation was arm them all. Uh, I've been contacted by Hartford, uh, a lot of other school districts in the state that have made the recommendation. Now, whether or not because of the cost, um, of the program or other political reasons. Some have chosen to do it, some haven't. But I would submit to you that nationally it is more common than not to have some type of armed security. Captain Hall just returned from recertification in Connecticut, and this is just germane to Connecticut. Talked to many other officers, captains, command staff, and most of them in Connecticut that he had spoken to uh, have put in armed school security. They haven't gone to the press. They haven't made uh, a lot about it uh, publicly. One high school in particular put in four former police officers. That isn't in the paper. Um, but it, it isn't uncommon. Connecticut, the land of steady habits, perhaps we're a little behind it. Um, but it isn't unusual in the, in the United States of America. All right, thank you. I still don't think that's many towns for Enfield. And I still think, though, I, what it, somebody told me that the high school, the new high school is going to have something like 220 cameras. And I, my feeling is then, before you put in the offices, and now, that you can do most of the, what you're talking about doing, and you can do it with cameras. The, the guys that uh, created the bomb in Boston, cameras caught them. It wasn't police work, it wasn't security or anything else. They were cameras, I think from Lerner stores, actually. Uh, the killings in Paris just recently, and I'll remind you they had two armed guards there protecting the 12 people that got killed. The first thing they did was kill the two armed guards. And once again, they caught the two, well, they caught them, they identified them with the cameras. And I believe that you can put up a lot of cameras, and I believe that you can put up a lot of metal detectors, and I believe that you can keep the children safe. The other thing I worry about this is if you do this for eight more years, the two you've done plus eight, you will have spent $8 million, probably more because you'll probably give some raises and FICA may do something and whatever. The other problem that I see with this, unless you get all your technology in place, at some point in time, if some council votes not to do it, you have nothing. And that also concerns me. The other thing that concerns me is I read in the paper that it had been called a success. Well, if it's a success, if it's a success, it's a success in every town in Connecticut because nobody had a mass killing in two years. So we really can't call it a success. And I would question uh, you hired safe havens. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg has a group, and I just read that the uh, thing of the Newtown panel that was set up has come out. And I didn't read where they're recommending armed guards. Now, perhaps they are, because like you said, but did we consult with any of their experts? No? Okay. You know, they spent two years. They may know more than us. Uh, I, I, you know, I really take exception also to the, uh, and the parochial schools and the Montessori to say, this is a great thing. Yeah, it's a great thing because their curriculum is not in danger. If you elect tomorrow not to have the gods, they still have the same curriculum. If you elect to have the gods, they still have the same curriculum. I still feel that the Board of Education is going to lose money. I don't think there's any other way around it. So with that, I, I read one other thing. Two years ago, I went to a meeting, and I thought when I went to that meeting, I was going to 
get input into whether we should have police or armed guards. And what I did when I got to that meeting, what I found out was it had already been decided, and we said they sat there and told us why they had done it. So I appreciate this that I did have a chance to give my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, next up is Claudia Good, followed by Mary Scott. Is Claudia here? Then we'll go to Mary Scott, followed by Liz Davis. <laughs> A little short, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, I guess the first thing I, I want to say is I'm hoping to kind of start off my feelings about the security guards in our schools by saying I hope that members of um, the town council and board of education have not already made up their mind. I really think as a citizen, it is really important that people have not already made that decision that they're going to vote for or against them. Because you know what? We weren't consulted last time, and I think this time it's really, really important there's transparency and people feel like they're being heard about how they feel about the armed guards. Now, I know most of you know my opinion is I'm not for them. I think they're great guys. I think the police chief has done a wonderful job hiring them and training them and putting them in our schools. My biggest issue is I don't think they're the most effective way to secure our schools. And I think the biggest thing for me is hardening. We have had this program for almost two years, and we still do not have radios that work in our schools. I mean, how unsafe can we get? We have classroom doors that still won't lock. I mean, really, we're two years in. If we're supposed to be on the cutting edge, we don't even have some of these things in place taken care of. These things cost money, these hardening features, and we're still not doing that. And I don't understand that. And we're just now finally training our staff. I mean, almost two years in, that's taken us this long to start training our staff. And we still have so many other people that need to be trained. I really don't feel that we are spending our money wisely. I really think there's more hardening things that need to be done. Um, I also took a look at the Sandy Hook Advisory Commission and the recommendations, and one of them talked about recommendation number 11 was identify specific individuals to serve as safety and security wardens who shall be responsible for executing and managing the safety and security strategy, strategy, strategies. They don't say an armed guard. They talk about somebody that's there to deal with those security issues. I think we can do this without having it cost so much money and necessarily having an armed person there. Plus, this person can't arrest. This person cannot you know, do any kind of um, search or seizure, and I think those are important issues. I mean, I, have, from the beginning, have always wanted a cop in the schools, not an armed security officer. I just felt that it made more sense. It's a way for our police officers to relate in our community with our students, be role models, and I think that's important. Um, the other thing is, they talk about in that report, the recommendation, um, school site perimeter standards um, being hardening. Access. I think we've done some of the good stuff with access. Surveillance, you know, setting up cameras. Those are good things. Continuing with that. And then parking areas and pedestrian routes. Those are issues, big issues. And, you know, you've heard me before about our parking lots are a mess. You know, our kids are more at risk walking in our parking lots than they are in our school. And the worst part about it is, you know, there, there hasn't been a, a plan developed that I haven't heard of to address those issues. The other thing is, is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm more concerned too on the school side about, you know, we don't even have school counselors full time in our K through two schools. We don't have money for that. So we have a part time counselor there. And one of the things in the report talked about mental health. It's so important that we do something with mental health. And we're not addressing that issue, especially in our schools. You know, you can't just do one piece, which is a, an armed person, without addressing the other pieces. And I think that's a big piece that needs to be addressed. You know, we need full-time counselors in our schools. We need a social worker. You know, we have a lot of kids who have problems. And they say one of the risk factors are, number one, males to do some of these kind of incidents. And also the fact that there are people, different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds are different. We have a, a wide range in our town of people. You know, we want to be there to give those support services to them. And then the other question um, I have is, is there a plan in place for cold weather evacuations? So let's say for some reason there, there's a fire um, at Enfield Street School and all the kids are evacuated out. There's no time to grab jackets, nothing. And it's the middle of, you know, right now, freezing out. 
do we have a plan in place? Do we have a bus coming to put those kids on it to warm them up? You know, as a parent, I would like to know what some of those plans are to know that you have that in place. Because like out in Tolland, they had an issue where, parent, where kids got, high school students were evacuated and ended up with frostbite, had to go to the hospital. And I'm hoping that we are planning in those stages and that we're talking about that and those things are happening for us. And then suicide prevention. You know, we talked a lot about that and Mr. Dorn talked about that as well. What about, I mean, are, is there an age limit for that? Are we talking about suicide prevention in our K through twos? I mean, there are kids who have issues down that, at that young of an age. Are we doing anything that young? Or, or are we just only doing it for middle and high school? You know, those are some of my questions that I have. Um, and then the one thing that I have to comment about um, that kind of troubled me a little bit was the statement of how the armed security guard saved a student from running out into the street and then the armed security guard opened up the door so kids won't get you know, going into, you know, taken away in the car or whatever. Who used to do that stuff? Our staff and our teachers. That's who used to do that stuff. Our kids were safe because they were there watching too. You know, yes, it's great to have this backup person, but who used to do all this stuff in the first place? That was our staff and our teachers. They were there doing that work. And they never got these pats on the backs. And they never got these, you know, increase in their salaries in that regard. I mean, that was their job. That's what they did. And to say that, oh, that's just this great thing. I mean, I had a child, my one, one of my students, one of my kids was a student over at Nathan Hale and he literally walked off the school grounds one day and walked all the way home. <laughs> and, and talk about like scary as a parent. And I had talked to them at that point and said, what do we do to make sure kids don't walk off our school grounds? It was to put an alarm on the back door. Never happened, it was about money. We don't have money for that. So my kid just walked right out of the school. But again, we didn't do anything then. But now all of a sudden we need to do all these things and all this stuff. And I, and I just feel there are so many better ways to, to handle this and the hardening and we really need to do and our parking lots to keep our kids safe. And you know, I know a lot of people are saying, well, this money is going to not be given to the Board of Ed if we pass this and so on and so forth. And I've heard that oh, they're not going to get that money anyway. So regardless of whether they have the school security officers, the, the Board of Education isn't going to get that money. Um, my concern is, is that as we continue to underfund education, we're replacing in our schools paraprofessionals, school counselors, social workers with an armed security guard. And that bothers me a lot because our kids need these trained educators because that's what they are. They're trained. They go to school for this. They know all this information. And they're what our kids need because they can help maximum amount of children. And, um, and I think that's what we need to also be investing in as well as the mental health. So thank you for, um, for listening to me and have a good night. Mary, I just want to, um, just because I'm the, one of the co-chairs of the Suicide Prevention Committee, which, which actually was formed um, a year before Newtown. It, it was formed after the, I believe it was after the third suicide that had happened in a, in a course of a couple of months. And um, I can tell you that, it, again, like, like school security, in the um, suicide prevention, there's pillars. One pillar being the training of, of staff, and uh, that training happens at all levels within uh, the school system. Um, the second one, one of the pillars is the school climate, and what's the most uh, visible would be Rachel's Challenge. So Rachel's Challenge are programs that are, are focused mainly at high school and, and middle school students, but there are elementary components as well. We actually have high school students um, being mentors at the elementary school level and, and bringing the, the Rachel's Challenge program uh, to the elementary levels as well. Um, and then it's, you know, then it's the professional staff. When I say professional, those that are dealing, the social workers, those that are dealing with the issues day to day. So our teachers and administrators are trained, but there's also that, the, the staff to support uh, within the school system as well. And, um, I think we're three years in on the process, um, and definitely there's a realization that we have to continue to drive uh, the, the training and the school climate uh, components to all levels within the school system. And then the, the other pillar is the community as well, and, it, and it's uh, bringing in outside organizations, trying to train as many folks that deal with students outside of the school. So the faith-based community is there, um, 
town of Enfield staff have been trained, public library, things such as that. Whoever has a contact point with a child at some point during their day. Chris? Uh, and Mary, in regard to your first, I think the first three issues that you had raised, I just want to make note that I, I don't know if they want to answer, but Chris Dresick, who's my counterpart, is here, and Dr. Schumann. I think the first three issues you had mentioned, one is the radios in the schools. You had mentioned uh, policies and the, the procedures and drills, and I think something about the doors. I don't know if Chris wants to answer it and about the plan that came out under Newtown, but I, I'll turn it over to him. Um, that's why they have hired an, an individual pursuant to that plan to go to each school to do a safety plan. I know that he is addressing the radios. The radios are Board of Ed. That's been a, uh, a function of the Board of Ed. Um, we supplied our SSOs with all brand new radios. We have a new system that the police use. Um, the Board of Ed initially didn't have that. Um, money available. I know that Mr. Harrison is looking at money to come up with that. I would urge any principal, if they think they have a, an issue that they don't have a radio working, I really think it's incumbent upon them to make their administration aware of it. We have assisted through our communications to make sure they're working. To our knowledge, nobody's told us that theirs are not. I mean, they do drills and they test them, but that's something that's impaired. I would implore you to ask that principal to report it. Uh, and I don't know if, Chris, if you want to add anything? I, I can answer the question for you. <laughs> We instituted the program long before the state jumped on board with the security mandate. And we knew that we were waiting on the state in order to get some guidance as to what this is supposed to look like. The minute the state got involved, it became a law. And anything that we did had to be in compliance with the law. So when a law gets passed, it takes a long time from the minute that it's written down into two or three paragraphs till all of the regulations come out. And those are typically in volumes. So when those finally came out, we realized that we were close on a lot of the stuff that we did, but we weren't in compliance with the state law. So if you're wanting, the, the, the answer to your question is we were literally waiting on the state to tell us what we could do in order to be in compliance with their new law, which is why it took so long. And that's why it didn't happen right away. Because while we were working on policies, we found out that our policies didn't match the letter of the law, which is also why we hired a security coordinator specifically to make sure that we were completely in compliance. And just, I'll just add, Mr. Mayor, because the previous speaker had mentioned it as well in regard to hardening and the Newtown Commission report. I will just state that we started working on this, as the Chief said, just immediately after Sandy Hook. Um, many of the recommendations, the standards, the threshold that that report recommends, we have long since done. Uh, we've done everything that they've recommended as a standard and more. We don't advertise it. I mean, it's, we, we talk about putting an alarm system in your house. You don't tell everybody which window is done and where your motion detector is, and you certainly don't post on your Facebook what the combination is to come in. So we've done an awful lot. Uh, a couple of the things um, that are goals we are funding in our capital improvement, we've gotten a lot of grant money. That money that the uh, manager spoke about, if we hadn't put in for it, uh, initially and done that work, the $600,000 that we're now going to get back, we wouldn't be reimbursed for. So we have been on the cutting edge in it. We have talked to a lot of people. Um, it's apart from the SSO program. I'll just tell you, we never said the end all was SSOs. We talked about a holistic approach to school security, which addresses the, you know, the environmental, the psychological of students, the hardening, technology, and SSOs. We likened it, Mary, to that we thought that the SSO is more like a quarterback. We wouldn't put him in if we hadn't done the hardening. Um, and likewise, we thought even if we had done the hardening, without him there, that extra value added, um, it would be the strongest. And you're right, some school districts don't have it. I mean, it's an absolute must, no. And that's why we're here. I think this group of uh, the Board of Ed and the Council, they've got to weigh that. All of your concerns and balance. Say, now we've had two years to think about it. Do we think we still need it? Is it worth the money we're paying for it? And I would just applaud all the speakers. I think many of the comments, they're so well thought out. A couple years ago, it was a little more passionate. Sometimes it got a little more argumentative. I think this is a wonderful discussion. Uh, all of the comments, uh, all of the perspectives I've, I've heard are, so, are just so valid. And it's nice to have a civil debate in your community and actually share these. and and let the uh, people you elected make that uh, ultimate fiscal decision. So thanks for all coming. What was, what was the question? It, the question was, and Dr. Schumann or, or Chris Dresick, what's the cold weather protocol for if there's an incident at a school?
All right, thank you. I'll, Greg, go ahead. I, I, this goes back when I was on the board, and, and I'm not sure what they've updated, but, but I know there's a consciousness of this. The question came up back when I was chairman of the board that what would happen, for instance, if a train derailed that had chemicals on it behind Info High School and Info Street School, and you had to evacuate both. And, and the answer was, obviously, we would contact the bus company and move them to a, a building that would be determined away from any type of flow of the air and stuff. So, so and I will say this, that Smith Bus Company um, is part of their protocols, is always uh, on alert in case something like that happens to be able to get buses over there. And uh, so there is that protocol. But you know, if it was Infill Street School possibly by itself, I know the plan was just that school, if something happened, it would go to Info High. Uh, and those kind of things there, but if something happened where that major thing, we'd, get, we'd evacuate the whole area, obviously, so. All right, uh, next we have Liz Davis followed by Ed Denny. Thank you. First of all, I wanna say, especially Ed here, regard here, we're amazing in every school, and especially here, because of course it's school my child goes to, so. <laughs> You know, he's, he's there to help. He's there to open the car, make sure kids can get out safe, especially when the parking lots were a skating rink. And it's an extra hand throughout the school to help out. So personally, and it's far from personal, but everyone knows where I stood even two years ago. I'm not for armed guards in the school. Personally, it's a false sense of security. And I do want to address, before I go into everything else, the radios. And um, since, of course, it hit the paper about someone getting in trouble for the radio not working, saying it should have went. And I won't go into names of what school, but I'm sure all the elected officials and our superintendent and assistant superintendent realizes who I'm talking about. I'm on the safety school committee. I'm on the school climate committee. Frankly, I think both of them, personally as a parent and in the profession I've been in for 24 years, is a check mark for one, to say we do it, because I really don't see a lot through it, and I am very heavily involved in my child's school. The meeting we held in September, which you were at, and we did the fire alarm, we're there to evaluate, and it was he, I won't say this, oh, I almost slipped where. And afterwards we evaluated it, and it came out that it was great, and it worked great, and this and that, and the principal admitted the radio does not work that she had, told the secretary, to grab the nurse's radio just in case because it has issues. Now that was brought up in the September meeting, which I was present for, and then all of a sudden I read in the newspaper, well, December an, an issue happened, and how dare, no, the radio really could not have worked. Um, we would have been told, central office was well aware, and I am a witness and have no problem doing a sworn statement for a few things I read in the newspaper. So, and um, it wasn't our guard that was present at the meeting, it was the one I think alternate and it was brought to his attention, and when I sat there, said, if you have any safety issues, let him know. So it was right there in the meeting with all, and nothing was done about it, which shocks me to read it in the paper, that it was brought the main radio to our principal, and if they didn't take the nurse, which the nurse needs a radio in case a kid goes down, they're our medical, you know, that's who takes care of our kids, didn't work, and no one did nothing about it. So two months later, there's an issue. They're trying to get a hold of the principal because the radio didn't work. That principal's in trouble, but it was never done. And I sat in that meeting when it was brought to central office's attention. So I just want to clarify that Elizabeth, it's well known we have radios. I, I, I'm not going to let that stand. I know from our SSOs and others that that's a board of ed. It's a discipline matter. It's under review. But they certainly completely and totally disagree with, you, with what you just said. So I'm going to state that for the record, that your representation here from what you heard that the radio didn't work for too much, that is, that is contested. It's not us. It's a Board of Ed issue for wow. discipline. But I'm telling you, we spoke to our people, and I would, I would just have to disagree with you to say that radios brought to our attention weren't reported or that we didn't try to help, even though it wasn't our responsibility. And I would just have to dispute with you because, again, that's pending and mm -hmm. people have the right to a defense and to be heard, but I would dispute yeah. with you that that radio was not working. So I, I'm just gonna okay. state that and leave it to the labor board to figure it out. Okay, I'm, I, I'm, I just I'm don't sure. wanna let it stand, there's a, there's a difference yeah. of opinion. Well, on we it. could disagree and agree on, on whatever we want. I know what I saw, and that's why I said it wasn't our regular one sitting there, but our assistant superintendent was sitting there. So what I'm saying is I heard prior, if there's a radio issue, it goes to central office. Not to you guys, what I'm saying, what I heard in a meeting sitting there, and what I'm saying now, 
is it was brought to Central's office attention. I was sitting there and nothing was addressed. I didn't say it was on the armed guards. Not once did I say that, because I'm sure if our regular one was there, he probably would have radioed in and said, let's get it fixed. My other concern that was just brought up is new radios were brought in for the SSOs, the armed guards. Why were new radios brought in for our staff in the school that's with these kids, spread out through the school? So there's another concern. I understand it's two different budgets, but we're now saying we have money to make sure one person has a great radio, but we don't have funds to make sure, I think there's four or six that will be in the school, has a great radio that links them to the police and does. I'm a little concerned as a parent. You know, I understand it's not one person that, that's going to do it all. It radios into the police. We have, you know, 100 is going to be here nonstop, and, and I hear all that. But what concerns me more than anything is, all I keep hearing is we have funds for this, which one person, I'm sorry, they're not Rambo. You know, as we just discussed at the town council, one officer downtown is unsafe on the beat. We need two, you gotta have a buddy system, but one guard in a school is gonna save the day. I'm not quite getting my head around it all. And my big concern is, not counting what we got from state grant, which is great, that's our state tax money, our town taxes that we pay into the town, 10 times more went into payroll than hard in our schools. Am I reading that figure right? 1.6 million in out of tax money was like 170,000. I don't know if numbers changed from our last one, because I do apologize, I was running late. So I don't know if the briefing changed, but are those numbers the same, Matt? So 10 times more went into payroll than hardening the schools for the safety of our children. I'm the first to say there is no price tag on my child's safety or any child. If it's five million we have to come up with, then we come up with it. But payroll of one person, when we could have had $1.6 million hardening the school, instead of one radio, every single teacher can have one of those fancy radios that can call the police and say, we have someone in the school at any angle. We need help now. There's a fire now. Instead, okay, go ahead, Chief. I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, you go ahead, Chief. I, I, I just want to um, make sure I, I'm clear. Um, at the council meeting the other night, there was a, a discussion about yep. Thompsonville and, and drug activity. Yep. And what I said, and if I wasn't clear then, let me be clear now. Um, we have officers that walk down there alone, and, it, and it's fine. What yep. I was referring to was, the conversation was about arresting drug dealers yeah. and doing that type of drug work. And we don't allow our officers, especially undercover officers, to engage with, with drug suspects unless we have backup and a second officer to make sure he's, he's okay. So on those operations, we need two. But for them patrolling and walking down there, one would be okay. So maybe, I, I wasn't clear the other day, maybe okay. you made it sound like you gotta have two everywhere. I'm just saying it depends on what they're doing. And if we're gonna send somebody into a place to buy heroin, I need somebody to watch his back. That's all I was okay. saying. Okay, thanks. You, you always clarify stuff, G. That's why I was looking at you. I know you'd come back with a clarification. I respect your opinion on things. You're well aware of that. But I am hoping to get an answer on why is 10 times more spent on salary than hard in our schools. Initially, and I'm with everybody, this should have went to Ephraim. We had the petition. You know, even if we did another way, I understand it couldn't go on a ballot matter even if we had 10,000 signatures, it can't by law. But that made a statement that, you know, and I'd be the first, if the community voted on this and by far they wanted it, I'd be right there. This is our community, you know, it's we the people, we all have a voice to be together. And if that's truly what everybody wants, then fine. But no one had that and I'm great we have where we can talk now, and we do have a petition again, you know, to remove, you know, not to extend the MOU between the Town Council Board of Ed. And I'd like to clarify that, because I know people get a little um, upset that are, are for everything. There's four MOUs out there. The one we have a petition for is Board of Ed, Town Council. Correct me if I'm wrong, there's only one MOU between the Board of Ed and Town Council. Am I wrong or correct? Okay. The other ones are separate because that's Montessori Catholic schools. That has nothing to do with our Board of Ed. Okay, so the petition we have is to our Board of Ed and Town Council to not extend 
the armed guards in our schools. We are not fighting. I don't want to say fighting. That's a little bit mean. We are not petitioning to go after other schools. And my whole thing is that I asked the other night, too, where does the money come from for the guards? It's got to come from something in our community. What did we lose to pay this? Because I know our, our schools don't have 1.6 million in Hardin and done. So what did we lose? It had to come. I know that Board of Ed budget wasn't fully funded. So did it come? In my aspect as a parent, I'm looking at it as that we just short shaded our child's education. In my understanding from the whole new town, the biggest focus, it was three. One wasn't the armed guard. It was mental health. And I understand that's one of the biggest issues to ever attack. It's, it's easier to put Band-Aids on things than to attack the issue, and that's one of our biggest one, you know, worldwide mental health. And, you know, it's not a simple hit a switch and here's your pill and let's fix it. That's a lot of work and a lot of money, and that's the key. If we address mental health, we really wouldn't have an active shooter coming in. So to clarify, um, I'm not for extending this program. We were told two years ago that it's in, so we have time to invest and harden our schools. And what I've seen in two years is 10 times more went into salary than actually harden our schools. So as a parent, you know, I'm not too pleased with that. I would like to, if I saw it match at least, like, hey, this is what we paid for payroll, but we still spent over a million on our schools. We have radios that work in our schools. And I brought up two years ago, I'd love to say, I know we have cameras. We should have cameras that the police department's watching. The central, I mean, they're watching something weird in a parking lot, boom, they're on their way. So, but Liz, again. If I yeah. could answer before you um, step down, in regard to the, the ratio, you're probably correct, um, but I don't want to leave the misapprehension or the misunderstanding that we didn't spend what we should have on the hardening. I think if you mm -hmm. look at any organization, labor is probably the biggest part. The police budget is how much, Carl? And how much of that is salary? 90%. What I will say, though, is, Liz, is this. You really have to put it aside. You're right. That 800000 for for salary, that's its own issue. If you look, however, at what we've spent and what we've done in hardening, we've been great stewards of the money. Some districts, I will have to tell you, spent a lot. One of the individuals said, well, cameras are the answer. Well, we had one school district, the, the chief uh, talked about previously, they came in in the flurry after Sandy Hook and they got 500,000 for cameras and the superintendent said to me, we have cameras coming out our ears and we have no one to watch them. So they become a great forensic tool for after the fact to see where mm -hmm. and who came in and what they did. But I'll tell you, this council has not rejected or withheld any, anything we've asked for on their joint committee. Anything we thought we should do in hardening, they have funded it. They've We've had grant money, but we've also had a capital uh, allocation each year, and we're going to ask for one this year. So even though you're right, the ratio may look that it's skewed, and it is, compared to, like, say, Winslow Oxford or Suffield, probably they're going to have spent less on hardening than even we did, but they don't have that other chunk of money they spent on the salaries for an SSO. But we have not wanted for, for anything. In regard to hardening, we've done everything we set out. We don't talk about everything, but I put us up against any district in the state or the country for what we've done. In regard to the radio system, we would never, just so you understand, uh, teachers having radios and being able to talk to each other, um, it was never intended. We never relied upon that as any part of our security plan. I don't need any teacher or principal to have a radio in any school. We have SSOs. We have other means by which they can contact us. I'm not going to discuss. It's mm -hmm. state of the art. And we would never want to clog up the system having 100 teachers in the school have a radio to call the police department. So there has been no safety concern as a result of the radio issue. And it is now being looked at by the Board of Ed and their consultant. But in regard to hardening, we've spared nothing. We have done more than I think anybody else and our neighbors. Um, and we're almost there, Liz. We don't, we don't need to come back to this joint committee or to the council and say we need a million or two. We've been prudent stewards of the money. We didn't just throw up cameras anywhere. We put them where they would be of the best use. Mm -hmm. We hardened where we thought it would be of the best use. We've used technology for visitor ID systems and we're selecting doors where we have IDs for teachers to come in so they don't have to prop it open to go to gymnasium anymore. Their ID can act as a uh, card reader to come in. So I would put our system up against anybody. And even though, like you say, if you want to look at that ratio, you may be absolutely correct. But that does not mean that we've done everything, everything within our power and are continuing to do. We have other projects on the uh, 
uh, drawing board that we're going to do, and then we're going to sit back and look. We're going to see what technology comes, what happens across the country, and we're going to take a breath. But we were great stewards of the money, and anything we needed, the council funded. So because we had the SSOs, hardening did not suffer. Now, in regard to your other point, well, yeah, it was $800,000, and that certainly could have been spent somewhere else, and that's why we're all here, to see next year if it will be spent for this or for something else. Just to go to what Liz has brought up, it, it didn't fall on deaf ears, the radio, and we actually had discussed it in the safety committee meeting, and Gary's been a great steward with the new regulations that have come down from the state, and we've asked him to put a spreadsheet together on anything he feels is lacking. And we did discuss radios for whatever, however the school system wants to distribute these radios. So they may be on the spreadsheet that Gary's putting together, but that didn't fall on deaf ears. So we're definitely looking at that. Um, we've asked him to come up with a priority list um, so we can put money aside in CIP. Um, so we can just add more to our hardening and more supplies for the teachers if they need them. And something that Mary touched on that was our concern from day one out the door, and, and I, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus here, um, but I do want to make it really clear that out of our committee from day one, our number one priority was for training staff. And it came up in meeting after meeting after meeting. And until we actually had some physical support, Gary was able to get to that component that we'd been begging the Board of Ed to take care of from day one. So um, I will say that Mary's absolutely correct. The training of the staff, a lot. I have a lot of teachers and principals that are dear friends, and that was the one complaint I got. So I was on my soapbox at every single meeting. So it was great to have Gary come on board because he made those things happen. Mm -hmm. So kudos to him. And we're finally getting to where we started, but it's a process, you know? It's like you, 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 you have to keep, you know, hammering things home sometimes to, to make them actually come reality. And uh, the suggestions we've taken from these groups, you, Mary, we've taken to heart. They haven't fallen on deaf ears, and I just want you guys to know that. Okay. And thank you, Ms. Hall. And Gary is great. Him and I have talked, and he was at the meeting with, with the school um, safety one, and, and he is well, and of course he's retired police too. He's wealth of knowledge, and him and I talked nonstop because we were like 15 minutes before the staff showed up and stuff, so of course we were back and forth on a lot, and he is amazing and extremely has knowledge, and I enjoy talking to people that has, you know, so we had some stories. So thank you. And, you know, it's nice to hear that the radios are not being dropped because he was there too. And he even admitted, he said, that's a major concern that the principal's radio didn't work during that. And to just bring up, I do hope we get a policy procedure. You know, I'm learning a lot more civilian lingo. So I think it's policy here. This, if you want to laugh on Denny, you had to learn it too. On uh, the cold weather, because I know last year, we had it here, and the fire alarm went off, and it took yes, we not, and it took a while for the fire department. You know, it wasn't a fire, but they couldn't get it, get it off, and it was cold out. And I understand people are like, well, if it's a real fire, it doesn't matter. Your kid's out there in the cold. You're right. If it's a real fire, my kid can freeze. I'll come and get him or get my mother up the road. But it wasn't, and it, it took a while. So we do need a protocol for that because you, you can't have kids out there freezing, especially like right now that have frostbit ears. And with closing, I, I would like to just add, I know a lot of people say I asked a child, and I've mentioned, I believe, either Board of Ed, I believe, um, do you feel safer with an armed guard? When you ask a child that, yes, you know? They're going to. You're directing that child what to say. I went to my child. I'm not going to direct and put opinion to my child. Loves, loves. Security. You know, every kid in the school does. So I'm... Not, and even now, I don't put, she has her own opinion. She's highly intelligent. I don't need to put anything in. But my question to her was, when you are in school, who do you go to if you have an issue? Who do you feel you're safe with? Do you know her answer? Her teacher. 
the same as it was as my two sons had already graduated from Enfield, the same as it was when I graduated from Enfield. So, and I said, for anything, not to you, you feel safe there? Oh, yeah, Emma. And last year. And then she started naming the teachers and Mrs. Boffy because she'll block any, you know. So, and, you know, all I'm saying is when we ask a kid the question is, ask it blank, blanket. Let them think for themselves. Now, if I said, do you feel, a guy, she would be saying yes. And she's taken off. You see that? She's tired. So, yeah, good night. But um, that, that's all I'm saying is, you know, do I appreciate what you all have done? Safety committee, yes. Do I appreciate the armed guards in every school? And are they great to talk to? Are they great with the kids? Most certainly, no matter what school you go to. So I am not going to put them down personally. I never would. And we all know if I had an issue, I most certainly would say it. So I haven't had an issue. They're extremely professional. So Chief, kudos to you and your team because you did hire the best. So personally, I have nothing against them. I just have an issue with the program in my own personal opinion. So, and thank you again for all of you taking your time out to keep coming out to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, next up, Ed Denny, followed by Mary Ellen Davis. This is probably a, a, a little precedent here because uh, I'm going to speak uh, I'm going to speak as a citizen and not a council person. Uh, first of all, uh, before I even got elected, I was in, in, wasn't in favor of it as a guard system. I, I thought it was a, a uh, false sense of security, one person. Uh, I've had 34 years in the military, most of them in the National Guard, uh, but one person standing at the door. Now I want to clarify something else. These guys and every person in the schools that I visited, they're all police officers, some of them are friends of mine, uh, they're doing a great job. Uh, I have no, no bad comments about they're not doing their job or they're not trained or so forth and so on because I know they are. Uh, but some of the things I want to bring up is that I think this is another layer of, and Mary said it, uh, you know, the teachers at one time were watching the kids come into school and the principals. Now I guess they, they've disappeared or I've heard that the SSO has performed some uh, CPR on uh, an elderly person or so. And uh, not a, <clears throat> I just want to say that, don't we have school nurses here still? And what do they do? Uh, so again, it's another layer of administration is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I want to clarify something else, that I'm an old guy, but I have five grandchildren that are in the school system and two of them who live in my house for the last five years, so I know what security of children are. But here's what I hear about security, and we had uh, Doran here uh, and told us a few things, and one of them was harden schools, lock the doors, and a security officer in that order. Well, right at this moment, the parochial schools have locked the doors, but the public schools have not. And if you drop your child off at Fermi High School, any time between the time it opens until 45 minutes to an hour, it's already a year and a half, and they're still not locked. Every door in that school, you can walk in at any time, and my 17-year-old grandson will tell you there's no security there in the morning, period. One and a half years. Now, if it was one and a half years to, in the military to my colonel or general or whatever as a first sergeant, I would have been fired or shot. That's one of my opinions. <clears throat> now, I got more, but I'm losing some of it. When are we going to lock the doors? Oh, in the parochial schools. All the, all the uh, non-public schools, I understand, all the doors are locked over there. They're compliant. They've done the best they can because they don't have funds like we do from the, from the state. And so this armed guards for them is a win-win situation. I know you all speak here. Uh, as a council person, I voted for the guards for you because I feel, felt you were taxpayers and you deserved to, to get what we get. But 
you're all up here speaking in favor of it because that's kind of like all you have. We are going to have more money to harden every school in this, in this district. And we're all going to get more state funds and so forth. But you're not going to get that. You're going to get the minimum. And so I agree with you when you say we need the guards because that, that's at least your first line of defense. Exactly right. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Mary Ellen Davis, and I'm going to grab the second sheet of paper. Or the, no, I have. John Fox is on deck. Good evening. I'm Mary Ellen Davis. I live at 11 Cozy Street. And um, I'm only going to put on the record because last, last couple weeks ago when we were here, one of the reporters asked if Liz and I, because we have the same last name, are related. I'm sorry. One of the reporters the last time we were here had asked, because Liz and I have the same last name if we're related, and we're not. We have opposing viewpoints that would make for interesting holiday meals, but no, we're not. <laughs> so just to put on the record, we're not related in case anybody was wondering. But um, to address something Liz said about um, her daughter saying that her teacher was the one she feels safe with and the one she would go to, um, I'm a teacher. I love the fact that my students feel safe with me and that they come to me over issues that they need to. However, I'm not a superhero. Um, I also believe that the teacher in Newtown, Miss Soto, who lost her life, um, also was doing all that she could as a teacher. Last time we were here, somebody spoke to the fact that they believed that um, lockdowns were enough. I believe Newtown was in lockdown and many teachers and students lost their lives regardless. Um, I'm not really sure if any of this is, is an answer, but um, somebody brought up the issue of pragmatism over this program and was talking about the practical versus the theoretical. We have all were here last September and we have had the reporting of the studies from experts that would go along with the theoretical. And if um, I understand correctly, some of those theories that they're saying that would work is that we have um, security functions, student interaction, medical assistance, cultural impact, and other benefits that the security officers would provide. And that was supposed to be in theory. And I can say from a pragmatic and practical point of view that yes, those actually have worked. We have put those into practice. And in practice, yes, they have. Our theory has been proved correct. They do work. Um, I've also heard somebody talking about the fact that perhaps you know we need more technology. And they talked about hardening the schools and needing more cameras and you need more locks and you need, you know, all of those other things besides the security officers to make the schools um, safe. Yet the security officer seems to be the only issue that people are concerned about. All of those other things have expenses attached to, and if we took any one of those pieces out of our system, our system's lacking. Our system lacks if you remove the security officer. This program, as it has been uh, presented to us as it has been made in theory and has been put into practice and seems to have been proven by itself through that practice. I think if you take any one of those facets out of that program, your system fails, including these security officers. Yes, the security officers may be an expense, but it, everything is an expense. Yes, our taxes are going to increase to be able to cover these expenses, but our taxes are going to increase for other expenses that we have in this town as well. Speaking as a citizen, um, a single person with no children, and the tax rate that I pay for my house is, is dependent on the size of my house and not how many children I have in my public school system. I have zero children in the public school system. And I'm still paying for it. And that's OK, because every child has a right to an education. And to get a true education, a child needs to feel safe. And if we get, then we have a right to have to be able to pay and to expect to pay our taxes to support these types of systems. We live in a society today that's very different from societies of even when I was growing up. Where, yes, my parents were concerned about me going to school, but they were more concerned because drugs were the issue then, and how are they going to keep drugs out of the school? Unfortunately, today, we're not only concerned about drugs in our schools, but we're also concerned about people coming in with guns and people coming in with mental illnesses that didn't happen before when 
schools were separated and you didn't have a classroom that was integrated with all types of students in it. We've become a different diverse community and with that we have consequences. And to have those consequences, we have to be able to be prepared to implement programs that people are gonna to agree to, people are gonna disagree to, and that are gonna be expensive and that we're gonna to have to come up with funds and people, if we want to be safe in this society, we're gonna to have to spend some money and I am happy to spend my money on the school safety of every child in this community and I would hope that everybody is in all other communities as well and that we should be proud of a system that we have taken the um, theoretical program and have put it into practice and have proven that it does work and that we can be proud as a community that we do that and others want, want to do it um, based on our program that has worked for us. Um, I know we're all gonna have to pay for more snow removal. And, um, you know, we have to pay it. It's a need, it's not a want, and you have to pay for needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, John Fox is up, followed by Teresa Jablow. Uh, the last time we decided or you decided on this program, it, as uh, that gentleman said, it was decided before uh, any public comment. And it made me curious uh, of the people sitting here, and I'm assuming you are the ones that will decide whether or not to sunset this program. How many of you have already made up your minds, if you would just give us an honest answer, how many of you are, are sitting here, and I know a couple of you are, like uh, Mr. Bromson, for instance. How many else uh, can we? You haven't decided? I don't, I don't get a vote. I'm the public safety director. I don't I, But that's the dynamic I have a problem with. You are, and I know you are, and that's fair. And that's what I, I appreciate that, that you're, in, you're in favor. We came up with the program and implemented it. Yes, we're in favor of it. You're in favor of it. And how many else would, would, would be willing to admit, you know, that they're, she's in favor of it? Okay, it doesn't matter if. I want to hear from each and every one of you, and I don't care if we're here till midnight, I really don't. It's important that every person that has a desire, that has an interest, speak what he or she believes, feels. Whether I agree with the person speaking, doesn't matter. This is democracy. I don't agree with Liz Davis, but I respect her, and she knows that, and I'm sorry for singling you out, Liz, but you, you, yeah, you and I, no, you, you and I are, Absolutely. I, I, respect, I respect that. So, yes, I do support the program. I'm not going to deny it. I fully support it. I think it's a great program. I think our team here has done a fantastic job, and I'm proud to be in Enfield to be in the forefront. But I want to hear what everyone else has to say. I want to hear if there's something that maybe we've missed, that maybe we have not implemented, that maybe we haven't shown the public that is being done. I, th I think that's extremely important. So yes, I do support the program. Thank you. Okay, and that's, that's good. I mean, that's being honest. I appreciate that in a politician, you know. Uh, you voted against the education budget last year. Was it worth paying for the armed guards knowing that the schools were not going to be able to hire for the positions that they needed? And we're in the same scenario this year. I will, I will address that. I believe what what, what you're referring to, in my opinion, is comparing apples with oranges, okay? And, and the, re the reason I say that, John, just let me clarify. When, when we look at the education budget, we look at that separately but in conjunction with the town budget. So when we, when we vote in May, we have to vote on the education budget and we vote on the town budget. I support the education budget. I would give the superintendent a million plus more than what he's asking for, my opinion. I believe that whatever education is asking, we should give it. I truly believe that, 110%. But I don't believe that robbing from Peter to pay Paul is the answer. I believe that each um, a program stands on its own merit. The education budget stands on its own merit. What the town is looking to do by going forward with the school security officer program slash hardening of the schools, um, 
suicide prevention, the whole enchilada, that's equally important. So I support all of it because I believe it's important. And I voted against the education budget because I felt that we, I won't use the word I'm thinking of, but I felt that we did not do justice to the education piece because I'm an education supporter. So I will always support education. But voting against it was supporting education? I would think that you no, voted for No, it the was the amount. I, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, I just wanted to no, clarify. No, it's relevant. It's I, relevant because every town that's implemented a guard program has also supported their education budget. Not one town flat funded uh, education through the course of implementing uh, guard programs. However, our town seems to find that robbing Peter to pay Paul, as you just said, is the alternative that best suits these needs. That's and not my it's position. It's a want, it's not a need because, uh, as we've said in the last meeting, it takes. It takes three minutes for the police to arrive in an active shooter situation. You know, have we had any, I don't know what you might call, uh, war games or, or simulations? I'd, I'd be willing to bet that somebody could hide in this building for three minutes unfound uh, if your armed guard were standing right here and they could, they could remain hidden for the three minutes that we needed for the police to arrive. I mean, is that, is that unrealistic to think that an armed guard is going to find somebody through the entire 25,000 square foot building that we're in right now or more, might be more, you know, within three minutes? Is that what we're gambling on? Well, let me, let me just say this, Mr. Fox. Um, this program, when we first launched it, was predicated on the police department's idea of delay. Okay, why that was important? is because we understood talking to the chief in Newtown and looking at all the school shootings that the people that come into these buildings to kill our children are homicidal and suicidal in that order. So what they wanna do is they wanna come into the school, they don't wanna take a chance and have a shootout with a guard because they may win, they may not. They wanna go slaughter kindergartner kids, they wanna kill them. When they hit number 27, they beat the last guy's record. That's how they do it. And then, in Newtown, as the chief told me, within three and a half minutes, the first Newtown officer entered the building. That person saw the cop, and then he followed his plan. He killed his kids, and now he shot himself, okay? So when we talk about response time, you know, and, and I agree with something Liz said and what everybody here said that mental illness is the cause of this or evil or a combination, I don't know. But we know that the best psychiatrist in the world can't be 100%. So when we miss a kid and he shows up in the building and the teachers do everything they can to save those kids, like the principal, we saw what happened. So what I'm saying is that if we miss it and the kid's here, however it happened, he's here with the gun, okay? So here's my question. What do all the parents here want? They want an immediate police response. Are they happy with three minutes? Well, that's pretty good, right? Three minutes is pretty fast. But we saw in Newtown, 26 people died. So would two minutes be even better? I guess so, right? Two minutes is better. You know what's better than two minutes? One minute. And you know what's the best? Zero. And when you look at those school security officers that have dedicated 25 and 30 years to law enforcement, I've said this before, they're already here. There's no delay. They're gonna do everything they can to stop that intruder, including deadly force, if that's what they have to do. They may win, they may lose. Even more likely, they'll delay that person from coming in and shooting the teachers and the students. And if they can delay it two, three minutes till our guys get here, then that, that's how we view it. And that's just the way I look at it. So. Um, it's interesting that you talk about response time and it makes me think about the article in the Journal Inquirer that, and I, I know nothing about this, this incident where a bag of shotgun shells were found in the parking lot here. But let me finish, here's, here's, here's what I'm curious about. Yeah. The shotgun shells were found, and they were, I guess, the principal was involved, whatever. But the question I have is, why would we assume that these were dropped by some parent, and not that there was a shotgun somewhere in the building with a crazed maniac looking for 
children or, yep. or whatever. And why is it that because of one circumstance where someone had a number in their head that they wanted to get before the police showed up, that this is just going to be the rubric for, or the, the pattern for every uh, school shooting from here on out where it isn't possible that, as other people have said, that there could be somebody on the perimeter or there could be somebody at a bus stop. I mean, Th those, this are, is the those are good questions, and I, and I have an answer. Okay. If you want to hear it? Yes. In that particular incident you're talking about, the armed security, school security officer patrolled this school that morning, and he walked by right where that, they found those shells, and there wasn't there. That was at, I don't know the time, 8 o'clock, 8.15, so there's nothing in the parking lot. He goes back to the front door, and he sees the kids come in. 15 minutes later, now they're there. So he knows they weren't there more than 15 minutes. And we also know that they're shotgun shells. And we know that shotgun shells cannot be fired from handguns. And he's, it's pretty darn hard. You might be able to smuggle a pistol in, but we didn't see any elementary school kids coming in with shotguns. So, even though it was unlikely one of these kids just smuggled in a shotgun, the fact that he had been there before, verified they weren't there, and now they're there, that is a logical explanation of what might have happened. But what we didn't report was people thought, okay, so that was it, right? No, we increased police presence here that day. And people said, well, I didn't see him. Well, that doesn't mean we're not here. <laughs> we were here. So that was handled appropriately. If those were 38 caliber rounds, that's another thing. You can't fire shotgun shells from a pistol, so that's number one. And the second thing you talked about was what? What was it, the, uh, the second part of your comment was what? You forgot. Me too. Anybody remember what he said? What was it? I know Scott knows. He's got a mind like a... I know it was the shotgun track. part, but there was another piece to it. And, um, there was another piece. And I, geez, not, it was a good one, too. Yeah, I, yeah that's right. Well, so they should have... Really no, that wasn't it. Well, I don't, I don't know what the second part of it was, but... It was just... Hey, Bob. It, Hold on. Bob, he passed. One more outburst like that, and I'm going to ask you to leave. He started. Everyone is respectful to he started. I don't care who started it. I heard you. And you know better. You've been involved in this process a long time. Well, the only the way right, it works, Bob, the, right the right only right. way it works is respect. And when you want to have a chance to speak, you speak from the microphone, you don't speak from your chair. I'm sorry, Mr. Fox. Honestly, I don't remember the second part of your question. I'm not sure that that was the point. I mean, no, that, if, that definitely wasn't it. It's on the record. I, we'll, we'll, when I see the tape, I'll call you up I'll and give me we'll call. Get an answer. All right, I'll, I'll be waiting. I guess it is a good question. If he finds the, finds the shells, why isn't he radioing for a three-minute response just on the chance that somebody pushed a, a shotgun through a window in one of the hallways? He, he, we, were and, noti we were notified as soon as he found them, and he's a, he's a police officer. He, he's not, he can't arrest people anymore because he's retired. He's a law enforcement professional. He was here that morning. He knows they weren't there. He's been at the front door. Nobody came in with a shotgun. He checked the building, and I can assure you we had the proper people in place to make sure the rest of that day there was no problem. Yeah, uh, I appreciate everybody's time. I, I feel pretty darn well that, that you guys are going to vote in favor. It's just because, you know, we don't have enough people here to, to have a random sample of the entire town. I recommended that we do a, a survey, a telephone survey, if anything, with every uh, citizen in town. It might cost $10,000. But as this gentleman said, it's better than spending $8 million over the next uh, six years or whatever it is uh, when we could be investing in our schools. And instead of having one position filled this year, if we're lucky, which I don't think will happen, I think we're going to flat fund the budget again, unfortunately, uh, we can invest that money where it needs to go. A million and 700,000 uh, per year, 8 million over six, seven years. You know, let's do what everybody else is doing. That is a solid solution. I don't, as he said, I don't see anybody else uh, unsuccessful this year in schools uh, security. So I just, I would hope that uh, there isn't a case of groupthink. I want courage. I want people to say, you know what, social services does a lot for this town. Let's put that money there. You know, that is the front line for a lot of the mental issues in this town. 
let's put the money and where is social services tonight? You know, are they here? I'd love to hear with their opinion and why aren't they on this uh, committee? You know, why, if they're on the front line with people with mental issues, why aren't they as part of this? And, and instead of having, a, you know, group think and one person kind of trumpeting this for the entire town when the entire town can't really respond, you know, this, this isn't working, you know, in my opinion. Again, thanks a lot, so. John, just to answer one of your questions on, you know, where is social services? One of the pillars is the school climate portion of it, and social services is heavily involved in it. And so Pam Brown or her staff may not be here tonight, but you have a, a group of folks that work both in Enfield Public Schools and the town of Enfield that work tirelessly on, on uh, school climate issues. Um, so b believe me, they are involved in, in the process from day one their input is so valuable, and they've made a difference. They're now looked upon as the model in the state of Connecticut. I don't know if you were here when I mentioned, when Mary had asked about school climate, did it get down to the elementary level? The chief said, or, or, or Chris mentioned, you know, the Enfield plan. What we've done over the last three years in our schools for school climate is another Enfield plan that's lauded by the state of Connecticut and being promoted to other towns throughout the state of Connecticut on the mental health aspect of it. So I think you have a lot to be proud of. Out of tragedy, something really good happened in our school system in our town in the area of mental health. Top notch. Teresa Jablo, followed by Beverly Pager. Good evening. My name is Teresa Jablo, and I'm the administrative assistant at St. Martha School. As the administrative assistant, I have the main view from my desk of 14 security cameras positioned throughout our school. Anyone who wishes to enter St. Martha School rings a doorbell, and after I request who they are and approve of them through the intercom, I have the responsibility to allow them access into the building. I'm grateful the SSO is there to further check on each individual who enters. Although we have state-of-the-art technology in our school, if the SSO is not there, the responsibility lands on myself and other administrative assistants within the Enfield schools to one, call the authorities, two, get people in the building to protect the school, and three, save the lives of all of our children. Because as we all know, it's people who save lives, not just technology. Our school security officer being there shares this incredible responsibility with, with us as adults, as we owe this to our children. We work as a team at our school. We don't only rely on our social school security officer to protect us, but without him, our school, our team is greatly weakened. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, sorry, forgot the microphone. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Beverly Pager, followed by Ann Sarpu. Hi, I'm Beverly Pager. Um, I have a kindergartner at Hazardville Memorial. And I just wanted to say, um, I spoke at the last meeting, and I thought I had said my piece at the last meeting. Um, but coming here tonight and hearing a lot of people speaking negatively about the program made me want to say a few more things. Um, the sc school security officers may be just one person and they may not be able to prevent a tragedy from happening solely, but they can buy the teachers and the administrators and the police department enough time to save the lives of the children. And while you may ask a child who they feel safest with and they're gonna say their teacher, and that's a wonderful thing. These teachers are fantastic, they're incredible. I wouldn't be able to do the jobs of these teachers, but they are not trained law enforcement professionals. And in the face of an, an, an armed intruder, it's not their responsibility to defend their children against an armed intruder. And I have to say that I, I have to applaud these, these men and women who put their lives on the line every day to keep our children safe, because they know that if they were to have to engage an armed intruder, they might not win that battle. <coughs> but they would be doing it to save children and other innocent lives. And the main focus of a teacher 
is to teach, not to worry about someone breaking into the school and trying to slaughter the children. And I just want to say that I don't understand why people keep saying this is a false sense of security when I see every time I go to my son's school that it's a real sense of security and safety that these children and I, I think that these teachers have and every other parent that I've talked to that I'm friends with say, I don't understand why they want to eliminate this program. I think it's the best thing that this town has done and it wouldn't matter how much money it costs to keep this program going that they think and they feel, they may not be able to be here tonight, but they feel that they need to keep this program going. It's not perfect, it needs work, it needs adjustment, but it's one of the most important things that we can do for our children to make them feel safe in an environment so that they can flourish and learn and grow and, and feel safe in that environment because not until recently were schools considered a, a vulnerable area and it's, I just have to say again that I hope you do reinstate the program and that it continues the way it's been going because they've been doing a fantastic job and I know my child feels safer and I know I feel safer having him in the schools with his security officer there and with this program in place. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Ann Sarpu, and then we're gonna open it up. I pulled the, the list, there's no one else signed up. After Ann, if there's anyone else that wants to speak, we'll go to hands. I just wanted to correct a statement that was made about um, the teachers or administrators being at the front door to greet the children in the morning. I am at the front door frequently to greet our students as they enter St. Martha's School, and my teachers are not far behind me as they enter the building. I also believe that all the children of Enfield need to be protected, not just one group. And the children at St. Martha's School, definitely, they feel comfortable speaking to me as well as speaking to their teachers. I feel personally responsible for the 200 children that are sent to St. Martha's School each day and that I need to protect them. I go to the gym, I lift weights, I do cardio, but short of me throwing myself in front of a gentleman or woman who's coming in to do har harm to us, they will shoot me, step over me, and continue on to the young children. I was hired, as was just stated, as an educator and an administrator, and I am grateful that Officer Scott and Officer Mike are at our building each day to help me and our team at St. Martha's School keep the children protected. And I don't feel that multiple statements that have been made minimizing their stature is called for. And I, again, I continue to hope that the program continues in Enfield. Um, before we go to any additional um, comments, um, I did receive, actually we all received this letter and, and the uh, resident could not attend, um, but asked that this be read into the record. Uh, to the members of the Town Council, the Board of Education, and Town Manager Matthew Coppler. I'm unable to attend the meeting about the guard since my husband has to be there and I have to stay with our children. But I have things to say and I want to express those things to you. When Newtown happened, the initial report was that it was a kindergarten class in Connecticut. At the time, my little boy was a kindergartner, kindergarten student in Connecticut. I left my office, went down the hall, and just sobbed wondering why, feeling selfishly grateful he didn't choose my school. My children, crying for those little children who lost their lives, crying that a line had been crossed, crying that the world has changed so much, crying that we can't go back. Social media has allowed and encouraged the negativity, negativity to brew. I have read a, a member of a Facebook forum say that, quote, I doubt Enfield is a target, unquote. Let's think about that comment. What makes a community a target? Did anyone sit back and say, boy, that town of Newtown is certainly a target? Is it drugs? Enfield has them. Is it video games? Enfield plays them. Is it mental illness? Enfield has that. Is it low economic status? Enfield has that. Is it high economic status? Enfield has that. Is it guns? Do guns make people bad? 
I am not writing to get into a gun debate. It's clear the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Although a principal in Alabama proposed that every child be armed with a can of vegetables so they can throw them at the intruder. Yes, that's a true story. That's acknowledging something bad could happen. But rather than invest in the safety of our children, let's have them all stock up at a ShopRite can-can sale. That'll keep the bad guys away. I said this to Mayor Copen when the guards first went into place. I am so proud to live in a town that is a proactive rather than an act when a tragedy strikes. We set the bar. Our world is changing. There is no going back to the days of Beaver Cleaver. So here we are, a couple years into it, and we're talking about ending the program. I never un understood it to mean we will keep the children safe for two years that the tragedy of Newtown would fade and be forgotten and our children would be safe by then. That money would run out and that's just too bad for our kids. I researched how many school shootings have occurred since Newtown. There was some discrepancy in the number, but the number doesn't matter to me. What matters is that it continues to happen. One is too big of a number. The older grades have a guard of some type and they know to run and hide. Our little ones don't understand that someone would want to hurt them. They are the ones that need protection the most, are most vulnerable. It was so widely publicized that Enfield had implemented the guard program. It's widely publicized the debate over the program, and it will be widely publicized when it ends. What a frightening thought. You always want to know your children are safe and protected. To bury our heads in the sand and say it won't happen here is careless. Enfield isn't the Enfield I grew up in. My car was stolen Christmas night from my driveway, but nothing ever happens here. Even my seven-year-old said, when learning of the guard program possibly ending, who will protect us? The custodian? What is he going to do? Mop them to death. Even he understands it. Our custodian is wonderful, by the way, not criticizing him in any way. We are blessed to have him at our school. This is just a statement about, a resource, about the resources the schools would have should the guards be taken away. And it is even clear to my second grader. There is a sense of relief knowing there is a guard there to help keep the children safe. It could buy time. It could serve as a deterrent. It's someone that would fight for our children's lives. I don't care that it's a retired officer. To me, it makes no difference, retired or active. I am not sure why that matters to people. They took an oath to protect and serve. I don't believe they stopped believing in that statement just because they are retired. Thank you for listening. I urge you to please keep this program. I think the positives outweigh any negatives. Our children are protected. Our children feel protected, and I feel peace at mind. Please be that town. Thank you sincerely. Amy Beth Serrard, 32 D'Annunzio Avenue. All right. <laughs> Folks that have not spoken for the first time, Mr. Tikaz, and then you, sir. Bob Tikaz, Enfield Terrace. I read that article in the JI about the elementary school and the fiasco. Uh, it seems like there was a breakdown in security in that school, and this was the forum tonight. If that article was incorrect, it should have been cleared up tonight at this meeting. But apparently, it was clear from that article there was a breakdown in security. With the security guard, Chris Dresick, the police department, and all the other people involved. It was hand, mishandled, but we know the, the school board doesn't have a security policy yet. They're still working on it after two years. You know, when you go into a program like this, there should have been a report on the threat assessment analysis. That was never done, but you went ahead with the program anyways. Now we're almost two years into the program. There's no report on the incidents, the results, how everything was handled. Any company would do this, but Enfield hasn't done this. 
and, and also, there's no plan for the future, where you're going, what you're going to do, how you're going to change things, with no safety policy. But I do want to compliment the town council for how they stretch our dollar. They try to have a zero budget increase every time so they don't pass on higher taxes to the people. But it's, tr it's truly amazing, on the school side, of all the money they want to spend, they can't come up with a zero budget. Enfield gets the third highest funding in the state, but yet the school board keeps saying we need more money. It's, it's, not, it's not a uh, revenue uh, problem. It's a spending problem with the school board. And we want to continue with a program that we had a breakdown in the security system in the elementary school. This is the night to correct that newspaper article that clearly showed there was a breakdown in the system. And if it's not working in that school, if it's, if it's not working in that, hold on, hold on. It was Friday's GAI. No. Well, this is the night that it should have been responded to. No. It clearly showed there was a breakdown in the security system in the article. I'd like to have you. We'll look into it, Bob, and we will report back. The shotgun shell. You started talking about it, and this security guard over here started refuting what you're saying. Yes, you did. Okay, but well, we have to reassess this program. It's not working. Thank you, Bob. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jeff Bemis. But I want to start with a question, if I may. Jeff, can you speak to High Meadow Lane? For High Meadow Lane, Enfield? I want to start with a question. I'm a little surprised nobody's asked it yet. Yeah, yeah. Just stay away from the mic. No problem, no problem. It's just gaffer state. Uh, so um, a question that I have is these gentlemen, the SSOs, why are they here tonight? Are we not directly and indirectly talking about whether they should have a job after June? I have three children who are looked after by these gentlemen every day. I see them every day. They interact with my kids. I'm trying hard not to believe that this was some sort of deliberate way of chilling free speech or a certain kind of free speech in this room this evening. I'll answer that right off, sir. They have as much right to be here as anybody else. The thought was from the manager they should be here to answer any questions. I said that at the beginning of the meeting. And you know what? Quite frankly, to you, to everybody here and everybody at home, I don't give a rat's ass if they keep their jobs. I'm not here to give former police officers employment after they've worked and got pensions and many of them have benefits. All of them were committed to the program. If they're here next year and the council budgets for it, good for them. And if not, I'll shake every one of their hands and say you did a job well done. But I frankly don't care about their secondary employment after retirement. So for you to intimate that they're here to intimidate or make a First Amendment No, 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 Amendment no, 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 no. You're, missing understanding my question. You're misunderstanding my question. I thought that was How many, question. I mean, look, not to equate what they do with babysitting at all. In fact, I'm about to say some really nice things about them. But how many times have you told a babysitter, you know what, I don't think you should have a job, you should be fired. Here's my kid, I'm going to go out for the day. That's what I deal with every day. And I have to stand here and tell you how I feel about these gentlemen who, look, who know me and know my kids. I know how many rounds of, of golf they play at Foxwoods when they go for the weekend in the summer. I, you know, and I have to stand, and I have to stand, and I, in front of them I have to say they shouldn't have a job? Yeah, why not? Every time that the board or the council hears from people... You don't feel that that has a chilling effect on free speech? Well, I appreciate that. Maybe the manager will not have them. For the for record, I, I feel it does because I'm the one that has the kids who are looked after by them. I engage them every day, and yep. here I am going gonna, gonna to say that I don't think this program should okay. be continued. Well, I just wanted to be clear. That wasn't the purpose. The manager thought they should be here so they can answer questions. That was the purpose of it. Oh, I, think it's, I, think it's, I, think it's thoroughly, I think it's thoroughly inappropriate. I think it's thoroughly inappropriate for the record. Well, and, and I... Sorry? You're saying that they don't have the right to come to the meeting? 
I think it's inappropriate. Well, can I, can I, think, I, I think whoever made the judgment call that they should be here when parents who they watch over are going to talk about whether they should have a job after so, June. So let, let me answer the question. First of all, and no deference to Chris, but I had a conversation with Matt, and I said, I think they should be here. I think anyone involved in the program should be here. And if you really feel that you can't speak your mind, and I know I've met you before, you've spoken at other events, if you talk about the budget, you could be talking about laying off a teacher. Does that stop you from talking about the budget? Or laying off a sanitation worker? Or laying off a police officer? Come on, it's the same thing. You have the right, as I do, to speak your mind. And any time we're talking about a money or program, yeah. when you're talking about government, you're talking about someone's job. So That's right, that's right. We're talking about some teacher. I'm talking about these gentlemen right here. Right here behind me, right. who I see every day. And, and when you're at a public hearing, well, I think you there's acknowledge, a teacher. You acknowledge I, it's a little different. I think you're it's stretching. It's a little more personal. I think you're stretching. Okay, well, I'm just saying for the record, I think, I think it was thoroughly inappropriate to have them here. Now, ha okay, having said that, having said that, the chief promised us when this program was instituted, these people would be of the highest caliber. They would be really well trained. They would be really capable. And I'm happy to agree. It is absolutely true. I like these guys so much. I see them every day. I think they're wonderful. Uh, I couldn't say enough good things about them. I mean, I think everything the chief promised is exactly right. In fact, if the economic climate were different, I wouldn't even be here tonight, to be honest. It's a money thing for me. If the town had a surplus, if you know things were flush, if the education budget was being fully met, I wouldn't be here because I think people like them should have a job especially if somebody in semi-retirement should have a job where they can be of service and use their skills. In fact, I'd even go further. If we had a surplus, I would vote for them to get benefits too. I think they should get them. I really do. But for me, it is about this economic climate and whether or not this is the best place to put this kind of money. Uh, some people I know have talked about the, hey, spare no expense for his children's safety. And I'm sure they're thinking, this guy has, and I do, I have two kids in the Enfield schools in elementary school. They're all three in the town daycare. One is in preschool, will be in elementary school soon. They're probably thinking, how can he speak so casually about his children uh, and make it about the economic climate? And I'll tell you why, because of the data. I'm concerned with the data and that it's been disregarded. And I've talked about this before here. I know there's some people in this room who say, because I've heard them, I've been to a couple of these, they say, you know what, I was afraid after Newtown, and I was looking over my shoulder all the time, I was scared, and now I'm not, and thank you. And I get that, I get that. You know, the human mind is an emotional machine. Um, Newtown, Newtown was very emotional. And what are you gonna do when somebody says that, and they're scared, you're gonna soothe them with statistics? I mean, somebody who's really scared because of what happened that day uh, in Newtown is gonna say, yeah, I don't want statistics. And they go out the window. They go flying out the window. I think they get a pass. I think that's understandable. Parents, teachers. But I kind of expect our elected officials to be held to a slightly higher standard. I am a firm believer of the old saying that it is the mark of an educated mind to be deeply moved by statistics. And if you look at the data, the data is clear. The chief agreed with me when I quoted, in a K through five school in America, the chance of being killed, murdered, about one in one and a half million. Michael Dorn also agreed. And then we've talked about how you have a five times greater chance of being struck by lightning. You could do this all day. But we're emotional people, that's why we buy lottery tickets and yet we go and get on a plane, which is, you know, has a much greater, we could be, if we could beat the Powerball odds, we should not fly on planes, because those are lower odds of dying in a plane. But we do this. But I think the elected officials really, they need to look at the data. And the data tells us unequivocally that elementary schools, and I'm not necessarily talking about high schools and middle schools and the SROs with the extra layer of SSO, I don't know, that's a different thing for me. I'm talking about the elementary schools. Elementary schools are the safest place you can put a kid in America, period. And it's not even close. Far safer than our streets, far safer than at home. And I feel like the data has been somewhat disregarded when the choice was made how to spend this money. Because this is money that we can't spend on anything else. And let's face it, you've had initiative um, 
you've had to deny some initiatives, you've had to do staff reductions, there are funding increase requests that are not getting um, granted. So things are tight. And I think when things are tight, we need to think about this. The other thing I want to talk about is some people have mentioned the parochial schools and that the town is picking up the tab for the SSOs at those schools. And I'm going to say, for my part, I think that is in the two ways that matter most probably just. If one takes the attitude that the SSOs are to protect Enfield children, then all Enfield children should be protected, no matter if they're in a public or private school. I think, I think on moral grounds, I think it's, it is just if that's the attitude you take. I also think from a legal ground that it is pretty sound. There was a case in 1947, some of you may be aware of it, school board versus Everson, and it pretty well established that it doesn't matter if you're in a public or private school, you have a right to certain key um, resources when they come down to a matter of access to school. In this case, it was buses, but it's also security. Fine, but that raises a question. If you can make that argument about the parochial schools, you also have an SSO in the town daycare. You could make the same argument that even a private daycare has Enfield children. And I think it's only going to take one complaint, and suddenly it's not going to be so clear whether that case would be a slam dunk or not, because I think it would be very shaky. I think potentially the town could have to supply the similar services and pick up the tab to every private town daycare and preschool on the same principle. It's possible. I just think it's a really slippery slope. And the reason I bring this up is some people see this as a very simple issue and you know, good guys with guns and bad guys with guns. And I think it's really complex. I think it's really complex. And I really wish it had been put to a vote. I really do. I think, I know you guys are elected and you, you don't have to take a vote on everything you do. But this is complex enough that I think it probably, you know, you brought Michael Dorn in so that he could take a look at what you're doing, give you feedback. You could make some adjustments and you could get his seal of approval that you were doing the best thing possible. I think there is another seal of approval you could get. And that would be a buy-in from the people who are really invested in this as taxpayers and as parents. And that's the, the people through a vote. I think if you polled it and you focused on the character of these guys, I think it would pull over 50% support, no doubt about it. If you phrased the question so that it concerned more the cost and the way the budget is tight right now and maybe, maybe the data about safety in American elementary schools, I'm, I really think that it's possible support could fall below 50%. And of course, that's the difference between success and failure when you vote on something, which we were never allowed to do. The other thing is, the last thing, and this is also kind of a legal thing, I kind of feel like the train has left the station on this. I was very, very sad to read about the lawsuits that are happening in Newtown. And I think now that there, is, uh, there are some parents who are suing because the schools weren't safe enough, that day that uh, the shooter came around, any lawyer is going to tell this town, and they wouldn't be doing their fiduciary responsibility if they didn't, that if you take a program that you put in place and you pull it now and something happens, anything happens, you are really opening yourself up to some major legal vulnerability. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that case develops and see what it means in the end. They may find a judge who throws it out and says it's an abomination, I don't know. But I think this is a really complicated issue, and I just think it really should have been put to, to a vote. And it's not too late. You know, you could do it. This is a good time to do it now that it's coming up for renewal. So I'd urge you to consider that. I just, were you going to answer the, uh, on the vote? So just to answer on the vote, per our charter and state law, we cannot spend money to get an opinion from the voters. So it's just, we're not allowed to do that. So, you know, you can't throw a referendum out there to say, what do you think about? There's very specific things that we can do referendums on, as you saw in November, bonding for roads or bonding for a new high school. We're not allowed to spend money to say, what do you think about the guard program? Or what do you think about all day kindergarten? We, right. can't, we can't do that. Right. So, uh, you know, it'd be nice to be able to do that, but state law prohibits a town from spending money. All right, but state uh, law prohibited you with the gun stuff that, the, that you were able to get around and pass some 
you know, measures and you said you made an exception to a state law with the carrying of weapons and things like that. I mean, no. in other words, no, no, General, no, no, that was not an exception. you said that the state law was... No, no. There's a state law that says yeah. you're not allowed to bring firearms into a school unless you're a sworn police officer okay. on duty. The law also said the Board of Education can make exceptions for anybody they want. And I went to them and said, I have officers that have kids in the school. They go to a hockey game. Yeah, I didn't mean to get into so specifically. We didn't, we didn't yeah. do anything. I didn't mean to get specifically. My, I guess my point is generally that where there's a will, I mean there's a way. I mean you could you could arrange to do it. I mean you absolutely could arrange to do it. No. Actually, actually, no. That there's been case law already in Connecticut that says that that is an illegal use of uh, town funds, and and they had to pay it back. All right. You'll have to forgive me. I spent 12 years in, in Los Angeles before I came here, so sure. I guess nope. I've been infected by the referendum system. Yeah, um, and I also wanted to address the issue about, you know, how you, you started taking this out to an extreme that we should have guards and pay for guards in private daycares. Again... I that, didn't say you should. You said that... You did. I said something could happen where somebody could make yeah. a complaint. No, yeah. On, this, on the same basis as Everson versus Board of Education. I didn't say you should at all. Right, I know, but, but by you bringing it up is kind of you saying, you know, making that argument that that should be done. But you can't be done because in the Connecticut, there's a gifting provision. We cannot do something for a private entity. We can only do what the state law allows. Now, with the, the non-public, there is a specific part of the state law that says municipalities can provide certain services to non-public schools. And that's exactly what we did through that particular state law. So for us to go out to a daycare and say, right. here's a guard we're paying for, right. would be but a violation of, course, of state law. Of course, Everson is a federal case. Pardon me? Everson is a federal case. A what case? Everson, the Board of Education versus Everson, it was a Supreme Court case that said that children deserve equal protection when it is separate from, for instance, well, the I'm, religious part of a parochial you know, school. I, I, so I'm, not, I'm just saying it's right. not state law that I'm quoting. No, it's, yeah, right. It's what I'm law. saying is state yeah. law in Connecticut, okay. I can't go out and put a guard in a private daycare. Right. That's a violation of the state law. Council cannot act to do that. That's fine. I'm just saying it's a right. federal case that, that, that set this precedence. I'm not, I'm not saying that they would win. I'm saying they could bring a case, and it would be difficult. It would be very complex. Right. But, yeah. but again, they could, but state law prohibits it. Okay. Federal law may or may not allow it. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm saying is that it's very complex. Uh, let me see if I can address your first, the first issue you had. Uh, my name is Barry Berger, and I'm the school security officer presently at uh, Montessori School. Uh, I had a lot, to, uh, a lot of dealings with all of the school security officers when the program first started. They all have at least 20, as you all know, 20, 25, 30 years of service on, on their respective police departments. So they put up with and they listen to a lot of stuff over those course of the years, and over those course of the years, I think that we've become, oh, see, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to being on this side of the mic. Uh, so over the course of those years, we've learned to deal with a lot of different issues. We've, we've got pretty hard backs. We can take a lot of stuff. Not too much bothers us. Um, we've come to a lot of these meetings to hear. It doesn't bother us what people say. And to be perfectly honest with you, when every one of these guys came into the program, they all knew up front, and it was pretty obvious by everything that was bit, been in the papers and written in the papers, that there was a lot of controversy over the program. Nobody knew how long the program was going to last. Nobody knew if the program was going to make it through the first year, never mind into the second year. Uh, all these guys still took this job. So they all knew up front that this was a two-year program that uh, it was gonna get reviewed after two years and it could be a job, there couldn't be a job. And they still all stayed and uh, they took the job. So none of us are worried about what anybody has to say here. Well, I appreciate that and you guys are so professional, I'm sure that's true. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes. Barnes, 5 South Meadow Lane. 
This is a little quirky. Maybe I won't use it. Is that okay? Use it? Use it? All right. Okay. I'll use it. Um, I don't have anything prepared, unfortunately. Um, my first my first thought is I recently heard and I haven't confirmed and I haven't gone in the classroom to count but I've heard that there's 24 kids in a kindergarten class at Hazardville not that long ago the strive two numbers were 15 to 17 I think for kindergarten 24 is pathetic truly pathetic we I think right before my oldest son started kindergarten, there were aides in every kindergarten classroom. We had to get rid of them due to budget cuts. So, so we've got someone in there with 24 kids, five-year-olds, maybe four-year-olds, six and a half hours a day. My point in saying that is $800,000 would go a long way toward decreasing class size. I wasn't aware we had a class size problem especially at the primary level, um, which is always my biggest concern. That's when kids need a lot of attention. As they get older, they can handle bigger class sizes. Um, so, so that's my first thought when I see those numbers up there. And I've, quite honestly, I'll just call it nonsense. I've heard the stuff about the monies coming out of the town side. There's a big bucket. We've got one bucket. And we allocate it to the school and we allocate it to the town. But there's only one bucket. And the 800's coming out of there. And it certainly, as many people have said, it certainly impacts every department. There is no getting around that. I remember Mr. Neville promising it wouldn't impact the school budget. That's an impossible promise. You can't detail your thought process as you approve the town budget and the school budget. You can't know what you would do if that 800,000 wasn't there and you can't make that promise. I'm really disappointed at that large of a class size for five-year-olds in the town of Enfield after years, years of striving for lower class sizes. So that's my first thought. My second thing the armed guards are good guys. I know a number of them. Only one, only one of them that's here. I end up at a lot of the schools. Um, I have four kids, and due to the reorganization, I had four kids in four schools for a while. So I got to know a number of them. They're fine. The, the issue is not these men, and hopefully we all know that. Things have really changed since Newtown happened. And it isn't just the armed guards. They're part of it. They're part of that feeling of, I'm not completely welcome here. I'm knocking on the door. There's a speaker. State your name and purpose for your visit. I'm not kidding. That's what I get over the intercom to someone who has been at that school for 12 years. That's how long I've been there. That's the message I get over the intercom at the school that I visit regularly. There's a camera. They're looking at me. They know who I am. That's not helping. So you have that scene. You have a guy with a gun. You go in. They need your driver's license. They're scanning it now at JFK, which quite honestly makes sense to me because the first year or year and a half of showing your license is pointless. A license doesn't make me a good guy, right? We're not doing anything with the license. You're just looking at it and saying, Okay, go ahead. So if we're going to scan it, that, that does add value. I get that. Over the past year and a half, other things have changed. The locked doors are an issue. And I have called Mr. Bromson's office, and I think Chief Sferraza the same day. We have rooms in these schools that don't have windows. And in mid-June, when it's 90 degrees out, and you can't open the doors, it's hot. And it's extremely impractical to keep the doors locked. 
And I have gone and opened doors. And I've said, I don't care what the rules are. I don't care who you call. And the lunch ladies have gotten hysterical with me. And they threaten me with calling the chief because they have rules to follow. We had a girl pass out during the movie, during field day, because it was so hot in the gymnasium. We're not practical. That's not practical. Let's do things that make sense. Let's open a door when it's hot. Are we keeping our kids safe or we're just being stupid? The doors are locked. Well, not in a room in June where there's no windows and it's 90 degrees out. And this is the stuff that has started happening since Newtown that kind of throws me over the edge. That, that I feel like guys at the police station are making rules like lock all the doors, which sounds like a good rule, but when you live it in the school, you realize this doesn't work. We can't have those doors locked all the time. Go ahead. You remember that day. Um, let me just say something about the doors. Um, I have no jurisdiction over the schools. I'll let the lunch ladies know. Let them know. Because if I do, we've got to renegotiate my I have, I have nothing to do Agreed. with the schools with Agreed. that. I don't make the rules. Good to know. But I will tell you that our priority at the police department is the safety of everybody in the building. That's mm -hmm. what I'm focused on. I don't disagree with you on the other things. I'm just saying I'm focused on safety. And I can tell you that um, when the doors are locked, it delays entry. There's that delay piece again if there's someone in the building. Oh, I get it. And the first day this happened, we went to the parochial schools. We asked them, could they, you know, that's our recommendation. And when we went back the next day, all the doors were locked. And I know it's hot in June, but I don't think there's a lot of school days in June. How about this month? Are the doors locked in the public schools today? I hope so. I hope because so too. No to but I know they're locked at St. Martha's, and I know they're locked at Montessori, and I know they're locked at St. Bernard's. So if they do it, I'm not sure why it isn't being done in our public schools. Well, I don't know. And I didn't realize that the doors weren't locked until tonight. Because my, I only go to the front door when I show up at the school, and it's always locked. So that's news to me that the doors aren't locked at the public schools in Enfield. I don't know what that's all about. But the front doors are locked, and I get buzzed in, state your name and purpose for your visit on a regular basis where I go. OK. So, so it's an atmosphere issue, I think, some of it. I spoke with Michael Dorn. I met him. Um, I learned from an English teacher this year that when you read a book, you need to know who the author is. You need to understand how they grew up, where they grew up, so you know their frame of reference. And I spoke with Michael Dorn, and I learned a little bit about him. And I learned about his childhood. And he went through some extremely difficult things in his childhood. And I think it's important that you know who you're listening to. His frame of reference is extremely different from mine. And when he thinks safety and keeping his children safe, it's very different from mine. And I understand he's an expert and he's put himself there and he's the top maybe in the world at this point. I get it. But it's also important to know his background and where he comes from. And we all, and I talked to him, we all have our specialties and we all have what we're good at and that's what we're focused on and we will go to the nth degree in that specialty. But everybody who lives in the town of Enfield doesn't have a specialty in safety. And so we're not on the same, we're not all in agreement in what he thinks is safe for our kids. So my last point is, and I'm going out on a limb here, um, I'm not afraid. My kids are not afraid. We don't live in fear. And almost we don't allow it. It's a self-discipline to not allow it. And we've had some things go on where you can be afraid, or what's the term? You can do it afraid. You know, you just keep moving forward and, and don't let your life be run by fear. And, and I do feel that way about the armed guards in the school, that, that it's a fear response. And that's why they're there, unfortunately. And for me, it's philosophical. 
and it's theological, and I don't expect anybody here to agree with me, but my personal feeling is we have an almighty God who's in charge, and I'm not in charge, and the armed guard isn't in charge. And he and I had this conversation. He thinks I'm crazy. Get a gun. You know, protect yourself. It's a difference of opinion, and I know that it's hard in a town of 40,000 or whatever to come together in agreement on something like this. It isn't easy. I get it. I get the kids. Parents want their kids safe, but there also is a limited budget. And even without the money, do I want a guy with a gun at the front door of my kid's school? I don't. That's all. Thanks. Mr. Mayor. Uh, not, Thank you, Carrie. Go ahead, Chris. Just to clarify, I, I think there's been a little misunderstanding today about doors. Um, there's two issues, and I just want to clarify them. One is exterior doors. Exterior doors in our public and the Catholic schools, exterior doors are locked during the day. What Mr. Denny, he brought up an issue of a certain period in the morning uh, where doors are open at a particular school throughout the whole school. After that, they are locked down and they're locked. The difference is interior classroom doors. And there's quite a bit, I, I point you to the Newtown study, and I point you to the Newtown lawsuit, because the basic premise of that is that the substitute teacher didn't have keys, the, the doors to the classrooms could not be locked without a key. And that is the basic premise of the lawsuit, and it's a basic recommendation of the commission. That is two different issues in this town. So be clear, during the day, our exterior doors are locked, and in the morning, some schools, they are open, but then they're closed for the rest of the day. And uh, it's an ongoing issue and discussion about interior classroom doors. My understanding is that, and I've been there at the non-public schools during the day, they have their classroom doors locked and closed. So that's the difference. So I just want to be, be very clear. I don't want people leaving here thinking that all the exterior doors to our schools are opening during the day. And a bit of advice that's solicitous and, and uh, not asked for, I wouldn't be going and opening exterior locked doors, even if it's hot, uh, on your own. Because that is going to be a violation of our policy. And you're probably going to, yeah. I'm just saying I, I, I look at the. I look at the risk to it and what could happen, and, and God help you if somebody comes in that open door and hurts children. It, we, we, don't want every, we don't want every parent in this town coming in and saying, I don't want to show my ID, or I do, or I'm going to open that door or this window, or I'm going to take my child out without checking them out. We do have rules, and I, I would encourage people, despite their best intentions, to follow them. Mary, come on up to the podium just so everyone can hear. You don't want me to state my name again, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Mary Scott, 64 Yale Drive. Uh, basically, in response to Carrie's point about the doors, um, yeah, I think there has been some common sense lost. And you are, in some ways, incorrect when you say that the doors are, have to stay closed. I've been over at Parkman. And when it's been a hot day, the security guard will come into the, to the um, cafeteria and stand by that door to, so we can open the door up. So we can, if we can use some common sense while we're doing these things so we can keep our kids safe, because really it's about safety, right? It's about keeping our kids safe. And whether they're passing out from heat or a gunman or whatever it could be, we still want to keep our kids safe. So we need to have some common sense in there, and I think that's really important. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of bring up was somebody made a comment earlier about the issues nowadays are about safety and security, and drugs really aren't as much of an issue, and, and that is totally not true at all. I mean, that's one of the biggest problems in our town is drug use. And drug use leads to crime. And crime leads to, you know, goes on and on and on. And, and I think it's important that, as has been mentioned tonight, the holistic approach. I think there's lots of pieces that we need to be addressing as we do this. And I feel like, again, mental health is really, really important um, piece. Yes, it's not going to be an easy fix, but I think there's some things we can be doing and we can be investing in. And I think the Newtown report has shown that, that it's very true we need to invest in those things. And with respect to, um, and we were talking about the, oh, what was it? Uh, there was something else I was going to say. It's getting late. <laughs> I'm getting tired. Um, I, I guess, you know, I do want to say Gary Harrison, awesome. I mean, absolutely awesome. Somebody who knows what he's doing, knows what it takes, understands things. Um, I am not happy that the fact that you guys have separate radios from the town, from the SSOs versus 
the people in the schools. I, I think that's, I mean, come on, we're supposed to be working together. And that feels very like a divisional thing. And I don't think that's... Mary, Mary the thing is, the police radio is for the police officers to use. If we were to hand them out to 30 or 40 civilian people and everybody started chatting on it, people could get hurt. So the police radio has to be for the police and the and the police in the schools. So, you're, so they're the separate. other radio you're talking about is something the board of ed has, and that's to call. The, you know what times? I don't know what they use it for. We're using it for police emergencies, and we're very guarded who we give our our radios to. So that's why it can't all be on one the same radio. And one so they in the and the SSOs have both. Is that correct? No, the they SSOs have, a, have my rate. They're, they're but part they don't of have us. have an internal one from the. I school don't know itself. if they have one for the school, but they certainly have ours. Okay. Yeah. Our, our, all the SSOs, the radios that we have from the police department. Programmed into our radios is the channel for that particular school that that okay. office is in. So the offices that, that Parkman, he has, uh, actually our radios have every school in it. So if I was to go to a different school, I'd be able to switch my channel to that school and they'd be able to contact me from their portable to my portable. Well, that's good. That and, and, I, and that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad for that. I guess it's more concern of, because we didn't have radios working and I, and, and I know you disagree, and I, and I know how strongly you feel. Like it's, you're, you're getting really you know, passionate over there. Um, no, but, but Mary, he's only talking about the security radios. Yeah, yeah. I think your issue is that there's some school radios that aren't yeah, functioning. Yeah, well, I'm just, what I'm concerned about is I want to make sure that we're all working together. You know, we are, we're working together with each other because really we're not going to get anywhere if the school side is not working with the town side and we're not working with the police department and making sure we're doing what we need to do. I really think that's key. And I think one of those things that Doran, I do agree with him, you know, working with the community, talking to the community, making sure people understand and having that relationship. Um, I really do think that's important. And, you know, I mean, we'll see where we go from here, but, you know, um, I do appreciate the effort though so far in some of the things that you have done. I, I may not be as pleased, but <laughs> still, I do, I do appreciate everybody's efforts. So anyway. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else? Yes, sir. And then next. Thanks again. I just want to make one point. And just um, through the uh, state your name and address for I'm the record. Sorry. James Smith and Phil Connecticut. As, um, as a taxpayer, there's one thing I always want. I want to, uh, our country is probably has the best armed forces in the world. And today our society is getting sick when things are happening at school like Newtown. And if we don't continue to keep guards at our school, it's gonna happen again. Because I know if somebody sees a guard at a school, they're gonna think twice if they're mentally challenged or if they're any kind of psycho person, they're going to still see a guy with a gun and think twice. You're not going to rob somebody's house when a guy's home standing in front of his house, or you're not going to break into somebody's car if you see somebody in the car. And I feel, as a, as a taxpayer, our guards that we have in the school do a great job. My daughter feels so safe going to school, and I feel safe. To see me go to my daughter's school and see the guard open a door, and my daughter looks at him and says, hi. It's like a relative, seeing a relative. And in St. Martha's, I, I'm, I think the, the school's got the really great security and the guys are great. I just hope as a taxpayer, and I, I would spend my last dollar for my kids to have safety in any school they go to. My money's well worth it for our kids, for our future. You can't put money in and take security from kids going to school today. And we need it for the society we live in. That's what I, I believe. That's my belief. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Mary O'Connell, 295 Brainerd Road. Um, my question really is, you know, I'm all for keeping my kids safe, absolutely. And I feel that this is the reason we're here till 10 o'clock tonight, because we're all passionate about that subject, obviously. Um, can I ask the guards and, and who's involved in the program statistics, though, as far as 
Has any of the guards ever had to draw their weapon? I can tell you that I don't know about these particular guards. We have a guard that actually had to use deadly force at one time. Was, wasn't, wasn't, didn't we do that, Chris? We had a guard one time. No, not here. In his, in his law enforcement career. No, in, in our schools. In the two our, years that this program started, has no. any of no. these officers no. ever had to draw their weapon? No. Okay. So my question is, do we really need to have armed security guards in the schools? I just feel it's another, you know, like you hear it in the news every day, officers accidentally shooting people that, and it just could be another accident. I mean, that's, I don't feel we need them to be armed. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Liz. I'll be quick. Elizabeth Davis, I reside at 201 North Maple Street. One, um, since the rounds was here at our school, and John's not here, I understood what he was trying to say, and the rifle being brought in easily could have been brought in the night before because there is no one guarding the school for every night event and we have after-school programs. They could have been stashed anywhere in the school, and any one of us as a parent could have walked in, said, hey, good morning, we're let in, and go get it. I felt very safe. My child is in the school. We discussed it immediately. He said there was no concern. That's why I was very shocked to see there was an issue in the newspaper about it because I was instructed that day there was no issue, but the paper is saying something totally different. So there it goes again. But I just want to clarify, any one of us can walk in, hide it the night before, and it kind of gets me is why are our kids' life so important during the day? Everybody's arguing that it, it's so important to have an armed guard during the day, but what about at night? We have night events with 100 and something kids in a school, but we don't need one then. I mean, our kids' lives are more valuable during the day, but not at night. An active shooter's only out during the day, not at night. You know, everybody says it deteriorates that they armed guards there. No one's want to go to the school. Oh, because they have it. Well, they're not there at night, so at night, I guess our kids' life isn't as important. You know, I just wanted to throw that out. My big question, I don't remember the survey, Scott. Um, I think Derek did it. Survey came out, Facebook, on something else in the town. What we'd like done, it was just like two months ago, right? So I, I understand we, we couldn't put our to vote for the armed guards, but how come we just didn't do a survey to the residents about the armed guards, the programs, and get an input that way? It doesn't cost anything on Facebook besides one of, you know, our full-time employees of the town doing it, but we do surveys for other stuff in the town, but we never did a survey on this program, and I think that alone would have resolved so much. And you, you probably would have had out of 45,000 residents, probably 20,000 saying, Yes, we want it, and 2,000 saying we don't, but you would have definitely had, you know, an answer as a community and a vote. So I know, I don't know if we can put, I know he put that together pretty quick, and he's amazing with this technology stuff. He's like this young hip, and every, you, know, you laugh, because he's, he's so quick at all this technology he keeps putting out. But maybe we can actually put one, of, you know, a survey out, Facebook, it's free of charge, and get some input. So we have a wide range from everybody, and it doesn't cost us a dime to do it since we can't vote. So the survey. I, right, I, I filled out the survey. I just forgot what it's about, but I'm saying, why don't we have one on the armed guard or school safe? Instead of keep saying armed guard, because I don't want to keep saying armed guard, because I mean, we talk every day. You're, you know, I know your whole history, you know mine. And he's marvelous and great, and all of them are. So you know, how about the school security program, instead of just keep saying the, the armed guard? But we have ways to do it without breaking our charter or breaking any laws. And I, I really hope that we take that initiative and, and actually implement something so we really can, if we truly want to say we want to hear from the community, then maybe that's a possible way to really get the community a little more involved. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Anyone else? Sure. Um, uh, Liz, it was uh, a survey about the, uh, the new town uh, website and so forth. 
I believe that's what it was. Something. Yes, that was right. So uh, I just want to leave you with one thing. We're at town council and school board. We're all up here, and we're all juggling a lot of these balls, especially about dollars. Uh, and one of the things uh, a lot of people don't understand, and I know you have kids in school, and you're and you're in that middle age group, or you're young. Uh, where you have a lot of uh, senior citizens that live here on a fixed income. I happen to be one of them on a fixed income. I'm very fortunate that I have more retirements uh, and I was in the military. But take a look at, go on the web and take a look at the foreclosures in Enfield every single week. And now you know what kind of balls we're trying to juggle with dollars. That's all. Thank you, Ed. Anyone else? And thank you very much for coming here this evening. The next session is Monday night at JFK Middle School at 7 p.m. And the fourth and final one is Wednesday evening next week at Nathan Hale again at 7 o'clock. Have a good night. <laughs>